<laughs> Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Monday, April 14th work session. We will have a, a regular meeting following this work, work session. And I will give you all a break, or if this goes too long, a break during this one, all right? Just kind of wave to me. Give me the signal. Sherry is not, uh, delayed, uh, but we hope she'll be getting here within the hour. So I think we're going to go on without, the, without Sherry being here. We have one item on tonight's agenda. Uh, and this is to receive information on the FY1314 department base budgets to include current operations and services provided. And uh, police, public works, division, and engineering will also provide presentation at this work session. And Brian, did you want to start this? Um, yes, Mayor, members right. of the council, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, just like we did last year, we, we try and get in front of council several times as we go through the budget process. So tonight and tomorrow night will be devoted to departmental presentations, uh, but we're also going to get a, uh, from the budget, interim budget manager um, look at the, a review of the 13-14, our current year budget, um, that really starts to set the foundation as we get into discussions on the revenue projections, which will be next Monday, and then the expenditure, um, proposed expenditures the following Monday, which will be April 28th. So uh, we, we realize that um, there's a lot of information coming at you. We'll continue to uh, uh, go through these in as much detail as you want. As, as we go through this, feel free to ask questions. But uh, tonight it is about the departments. They'll do it at a fairly high level. Um, so when they, uh, if you do have questions, please ask them. They'll be talking about uh, some of their key results of, and activities that they're doing that would involve supplementals um, that you authorize for this year where they're at, uh, as well as uh, they'll get into challenges for next year too. So um, we will not be talking about supplemental requests yet. Uh, those will be coming to council um, in the next couple of days, so uh, at which you'll have to, to review prior to April 28th. Um, but the uh, base budget, you have, you're the driver over there. Um, so you'll see up here that uh, uh, we are going through all, all of these items that will include performance measures. Uh, they'll talk about uh, some of the uh, efficiencies that, they, that they've done as well. Um, so uh, again, questions and answer or questions during their presentations is fine. As I stated, it's really a high level tonight, and it's looking at the, their um, operating base budget. So tonight we'll have police, public works, and engineering. And then tomorrow night we'll have fire, development services, ITS, which is our uh, information systems, uh, computers, if you will, and parks and recreation. Um, so we have a lot of information to um, uh, go over over the next couple of nights. And what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to Kim, who will really give us a status of where we're at for our first three quarters of this fiscal year. So um, Kim, it's up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to present to you this evening. Uh, so before we get into the department-specific budgets and review what they're doing this year, we wanted to just kind of remind you of the budget that was adopted in July. Uh, so you'll see here we have an overall budget of $205 million, and that is our state uh, set maximum. That's what we adopted, and so we can't spend more than that per state law. And so what, a couple things I want to point out on this slide is you'll see uh, the proposed infrastructure revenue and grants. That's about 15% of our budget. And those are placeholder amounts. And what that means is that we will not spend those monies unless we have a revenue source that comes in. Because we have that state set limit, if we have an improvement district come in or grants that come in after the budget has been adopted, we need a mechanism to receive that. So that's what that 15% will allow us to do. We have the enterprise funds, that's the red slice there at 15% of the budget. That is the revenue that we receive from the rates um, and provides direct support for the operations for water, wastewater, and sanitation. Our fund balance, which is really our carryover for our capital projects, so every year you adopt capital projects that move forward in that year, typically they're not done in one year time span, and so we have carryover funds. And then that also includes your contingency amount, that $16.3 million that we have per our budget policies. Our development impact fees are 4% of our budget, $8.7 million. That's revenue that's paid directly to support growth-related projects. And you see those budgeted in our capital improvement plan to support those projects that are identified. 
And then the green slice, our taxes and surcharges, that's our largest part there at 43%. And that contains our sales tax revenue, our property tax revenue, and uh, the development-related revenue that we, we frequently talk about when we talk about our operations. So talking about where that money goes, I uh, just want to point out to the, the 16.3, that's the reserve that I talked about that's per our budget policies, and then the purple slice to the left, that is that placeholder amount. So uh, those slices are ones that we really don't expend typically during the year unless we have revenue that comes in. The capital in one time, again. Question, yes. excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. Would, would you like us to ask yeah, questions? she said that. She oh, said that. Oh, fine. Just I must know. have been. First of all, um, I'm behind in this book. Okay, I've had a ridiculous two weeks and I am behind. So I apologize if I ask questions that are already in here. But um, at the beginning when you had the enterprise funds user fees, the, the $30 million, um, when we go into where the money goes, is it possible and it may be in here to actually see what the enterprise money is going out? I mean, if it, you know, you're showing the actual uh, percent of 15% of enter enterprise revenues, but you don't have that reverse of the same piece of pie when it comes to where the money goes. So is it possible to, get to see that? Yes. I'll, is it um, in here? And yes. I and, and, and what I'll do after I go over the 205 where it goes, we actually get into the operating budget. Uh, and then I'll elaborate a little bit more uh, beyond that because that piece is operating and then I'll fill in those blanks for you. Uh, so the, the big picture, the 205, uh, as I was mentioning, the, the capital in one time, every year you adopt a, a capital improvement plan, and the, the projects for that fiscal year are the ones that move forward. So that 43.7 includes new projects for this year and then the carryovers that I just mentioned. Uh, our debt service is $26 million. That's 13% of the budget, and that does include all of our GO bonds, water revenue bonds, um, the secondary property tax, uh, GO bonds, and excuse me, the PIC bonds, and then also our improvement district, and that's about three and a half million dollars per year. And I just wanted to remind the council that uh, that is a pass through, so we do receive assessment payments, uh, but we do um, have the debt in our budget, so we can make those payments. The operations piece, that 87.5, that's the piece where you're really going to focus your attention over the next two days when you hear about the department budgets. Uh, that is the most significant part of our budget, um, and uh, I'll get into the details of that here. This shows you a breakdown by department. Uh, again, the 87.5 million is all funds, including enterprise and general fund. Of that, we have 60.4 million. That is the general fund operating. Wanted to point out that public safety is about one third of the budget, and so you'll see up there that we have fire about 15 percent of the budget, and police at 18 percent. Uh, the utility enterprise funds, uh, you'll see them up there, and total with the utilities and sanitation, that's about 17 percent of the operating budget. And just to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, beyond our operations, we also have funds from our utility revenue that go toward our capital improvement plan. Uh, and that's allocated each year based on projects that are non-growth related and available revenue. And then we also have our debt service, both for water and wastewater. And uh, when we're on a break, I can get those specific amounts for you, but that makes up the rest of that. that well, and use. I think that uh, it seems to me that, when we're, uh, that it has been increasing in, the, in utilities and sanitation. Is that right, the uh, percentage in the last few years, just because of the projects? As far as I the, the capital plan, I'm not asking you to draw on that. I'm not asking you to draw on that. I can, I can ask that later and I get can that figure. Right. Mm -hmm. Joe, question: Is that 60.4 million after or before the transfer is out? You know, money that goes out to cover, you know, the ballpark and the ballpark debt. And the, the 60 million is just operating funds, so before the transfers. Before the transfers, okay. So the actual amount. Again, you don't have to show me now, but what I want to do is see how much of the general fund operating revenue we actually have for general fund operations. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. You mean for the ballpark? No, no, no. no, no for no, general, no. just What's general actually form. is usable for general fund okay. right. operations, All because right. some of it is being transferred out to ballpark Her and other stuff. And yeah. things okay. like that, yes. And we can include that in subsequent presentations. Okay, thanks. Uh, and so the only thing I wanted to point out here is that the presentations that you'll hear over the, the next two days 
uh, cover about 83% of our budget. And so you'll really get a good flavor of what our budget that we adopted this year is, is accomplishing. Really briefly, um, you don't have these in your presentation, but because of the timing, uh, we just received, we just closed out our third quarter uh, of the year, and we just received our revenue and expenditure estimates. And so thought it was very timely to put that information in here for you so you could kind of see where we are at uh, at the third quarter. Uh, and this, the third quarter budgets do come to the council for um, approval of the transfers, and you will see those in May. Uh, but this is really relevant to the presentations over the next two days. So this is a picture of the general fund here, and you'll recognize this from your quarterly updates. Uh, again, you'll see that overall our revenues are looking very strong as they have been uh, throughout this fiscal year. Um, our construction sales tax, you'll see there at 140%, and overall our general fund revenues at 115%. So again, uh, coming in very strong. As far as the general fund expenditures, uh, for the third quarter we are at 65%. And I just want to point out that may seem low, you may think 75%, but it's very much in line with where we expect. Uh, we don't typically trend exactly at the quarter mark. Mm -hmm. And for perspective, last year at this time we were at 66%. So again, very much in line with where we would expect to see us at this point in the year. As far as our other funds, starting with the revenue, We'll see here that, again, we're coming in, we're tracking right where we have been all fiscal year. Uh, again, HERF a little bit below the 100% mark and wastewater a little bit high. And we did talk about that at the last uh, quarterly uh, update that was presented to Council, that we're really monitoring that to make sure that those revenue structures are appropriate and also how that's correlating to our subsequent expenditures because typically when we see revenues coming in higher, that means some offsetting expenditures because there's an increase in demand. So, that's Joe. Just as a follow-up, we had talked about this on the last time. I just want to make sure that 120, and I realize expenditures may be correlating up as well, but that if, if it's high, then we want when we do our rate study, we want to make appropriate adjustments accordingly uh, if, if that trend continues. Absolutely. Thank you. And then on the expenditure side, uh, again, typically where we expect to see our levels for this year, including HERF, which looks really low, but the significant uh, portion of that budget is for our pavement management program, which yeah. happens in the spring. And so we'll see a lot of that expenditures hitting this next fourth quarter, uh, but very much in line with where we have been uh, trending this, this, um, this quarter in previous fiscal years as well. Are there any questions? Yeah. Joanne? Uh, will you be sending out a uh, report on the breakdown, actually, of retail? Uh, I know you had construction and regular retail sales tax, but then the breakdown of retail within restaurants and um, hotels, that type of thing. Yeah, we will be producing a third quarter report. So that will come to the council along with the budget transfers okay. in May. But just thought it was May. kind of timely to give you that information now as we review this. May I just one minute? Joe? Just real quick on your expenditures. Uh, right now at the thir third quarter, does it look or any of your earlier estimates, and again, I won't hold you to that, earlier estimates, are we looking at 95%, 90%, 90, you know, you know what I mean, of mm -hmm. total budgeted expenditures? Yeah, we typically, we're trending uh, where we would expect, we typically expect to come in about 96%, Okay. and that's right where we're tracking, again, very consistent with where we've come in, and we try to be within that 4% range. Okay, thank you. If there's no other questions about that portion, I'll move to the set, please. Okay. okay. That. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, we're honored tonight to be the doing the first budget presentation of the year. Um, with me, I have my budget liaison, Susan Petty, um, who may be able to provide some input during the presentation, but also is in charge of the clicking duties. And um, so, she, if she has any difficulty, maybe why not? We'll come up and help us. <laughs> um, so tonight, we'll start with strategic planning and how our programs and initiatives meet council's goals. We'll do an overview of the police department's organizational structure and budget. 
We'll discuss our supplementals that you were gracious enough to give us this year. I will give you a quick performance measures update, and then we'll discuss some of our priorities for the coming year. And please, at any time during the presentation, if you have any questions, just stop me and we'll get those answered. Um, to go through each of these topics a little bit, fiscal and resource management, um, the first bullet in there is intelligence-led policing. Um, this is a, a relatively new concept in policing across the country, and it's the direction that we're going. And basically what it does, it looks at our data and ties that into our crime analysis and our crime mapping, and it allows us to be proactive in fighting crime. Um, for those of you who have been to the CompStat meetings, it's very similar. It helps predict crime, predicts our trends, and allows us to be very proactive. Our New World Systems, that's our computer-aided dispatch and records management software program. Uh, it also provides programs for our, our mobile data terminals and computers in the cars. And streamlining agency processes, we're always looking for ways to reduce officers' paperwork. We have hundreds of forms at the police department. We're always looking for ways to streamline those forms and looking for ways to be more efficient and effective. And actually, we're going to talk about some of those processes in another, another part of this presentation in a few minutes. Okay. Under economic vitality, um, social media, we're very active on Facebook, very active on Twitter. Uh, we have articles in, in focus in um, the Australian magazines. We work with Christina and Neighborhood Services to get information out to our HOAs. Um, we will have a significant amount of information on our website soon. Our goal is to get info to our residents as soon as possible when events happen in our community. That's our goal. Under sense of community, we have many community policing initiatives, which is a goal of our agency. I know that uh, the programs list, everybody knows about those. Also, one additional program, our school substation program, I have to uh, mention that. Um, it was showcased recently at the uh, Arizona City Managers Conference. It's uh, become a national model. There's uh, cities across the country who have adopted this program, as far east as the city of Dunwoody, Georgia, and uh, so we're very proud of that. Under quality of life, our prescription drug drop box, again, very successful. We've uh, destroyed over 1,200 pounds of prescription drugs collected during 2013, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Sonoran Valley, <coughs> um, we're still active there, but we've done significant analysis looking in to determine the, the about assuming law enforcement services there. Um, this year, we've got 11% increase from the county um, for us. Uh, which basically we were paying 166000 a year for service. We're jumping up to about 185, um, which covers their pay raises, retirements, cost of equipment. Um, there are significant issues with trying to take over law enforcement services there. Uh, we have some backup and officer safety issues. Uh, we have some radio reception issues. Probably the, the most troubling issue is that even if we would put an officer or two down there and try to assume those services, you still have a significant amount of time left in the week where we don't have anybody there. So any calls for service that come in, we would be responsible for, meaning it's a 50-mile drive down. Um, if it's a serious incident, we may have to send two or three officers down there, pretty much depleting our services for our city. Um, so what you're saying, response time is not good? Response time is not good. Okay. Um, cost, the wear and tear on vehicles, you know, it, it's, again, it's a 50-mile trip down. Um, mm -hmm. In an open area like that, you could easily put 100, 150 miles a night on a car. Um, there's going to be increased fuel costs. You're going to have to fill up, you know, during your shift for every officer that worked down there. Anyways, there, there's a significant number of issues with assuming that service. So that's, uh, that's the increase in the fees to MCSO this year. At the uh, police department, we actually added two additional goals into our strategic plan. Our policy management, we continue to update our policies, uh, allowing us to be as efficient and effective as possible. Uh, training, we provide a significant amount of training to our employees. Um, one of my top priorities is I want the best trained staff in the Valley as far as our police department. All of our supervisors are completing supervisory school. Um, many of them are attending the post school, which is three weeks long, a very comprehensive school. Um, we're focusing on some of my staff members and getting them to some of the top executive level training courses in the country. 
We have five staff members who have completed the FBI National Academy in Virginia. Um, Jimmy Rodriguez just returned from being there 10 weeks. That selection process to get in the FBI Academy takes three to five years. Um, Jeff Rogers just returned from the Southern Police Institute in Kentucky, where he attended a 12-week school, which is that one's really probably the top academic school in the country. Uh, James Hernandez just completed Northwestern Police School of Staff and Command, which is 10 weeks. So those are probably the top three schools in the country. And again, it's the focus of getting our staff members and my managers as well trained as possible. Traffic Bill, safety. I'm sorry. Bill Chief, has a question. <clears throat> while you're on the subject of training, what is your um, what is your training budget? We have that number available. We'll get that for you. Okay. Joe, yeah, do you want to ask your question while he's getting that? Yeah, just a, just a comment. Uh, again, I, I mentioned in the last last meeting when it comes to public safety. I believe it's a really strong business decision to have the best and the brightest trained out there because if not, it pays down the road as far as risk. And we've seen that in the past on what it's cost us. So, experience that. Yeah, so, so uh, again, I appreciate your effort on the training side. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Joanne has one maybe. You can uh, as a follow-up also, um, you have crime prevention tips for businesses. Could you afford uh, me what that program is? I absolutely can. Thank you. $55,000. 55000 is our training budget department wide. Thank you. Um, traffic safety, our DDACs, which is our data driven approach to, to traffic safety. Um, what that is, is we study crash data to determine our worst intersections. And um, then it's all about educational campaigns and enforcement details to try to reduce the number of crashes there. And also, our Governor's Office of Highway Safety, this year we got $40,000 in grant for overtime. We use that for our DUI operations. Also, we were just at a meeting Friday, and they asked us if we needed anything else, and obviously we want another speed trailer. So um, they told us this in the paperwork in, so we're, we're you know, That's a nice when they start that. asking you. It, it is. It is. So a... we're optimistic that yes. uh, we may get that, too. Very good. Our organizational charts. Um, the Office of the Chief up top is uh, includes administrative services, which is my uh, our fleet and facilities, my budget liaison, our records unit, uh, public information officer, professional standard users, and property and evidence. There's two main bureaus, uh, each commanded by a deputy chief. One enforcement uh, that incorporates patrol as well as uh, criminal investigations. On the other side, support services has all of our special units as well as our community services. For our budget and personnel, um, we have a $15.9 million budget. Uh, as you know, that represents 19.2 of the city's budget, um, the largest operating budget. 84% of that covers our 129 personnel dedicated to the police department. 16% of that goes to our contracts, our Sonoran Valley, our booking fees, ammunition, training, et cetera. Um, again, we'll go over the, the different units, the Office of the Chief. We already talked about what, what uh, falls under there. Go ahead. Um, the budget for the Office of the Chief, there's 14 employees in, a, in that, under that function. 46% um, 40 is personnel cost. There's a large amount, 37%, that goes to contractual because that's where all our contracts fall. 17%, again, another large amount under commodities, which that's where our fuel is administered from, quartermaster supplies and equipment. Our Enforcement Bureau, we talked about that. That's our patrol and investigations. And actually, there, there's a map of the city. We really have three different districts. We have our first distri district is north of I-10. The second one is south of I-10 to the Gila River, and the third one is south of that. Normally, we have one to two officers in each of those areas. Um, if we have one squad working, that's normally what it turns out to be. Many times we have more than that. Um, we try to at least keep that coverage. 99% of the field operations budget is for employees. Um, there's a very small amount that recover, that, that covers um, training and some minor patrol type items. Under investigations, uh, 
98% of theirs is personnel, and again, they have a very small percent that's uh, dedicated to training and uh, some minor supplies, crime scene type supplies. Our support services side, again, all our special units, our community services unit. Our canine unit, just to give you some numbers, our canine unit consists of four officers, three officers and a sergeant. Uh, traffic unit has seven, training has two. We have three school resource officers who are, who are each of the high schools. They also cover our middle school and our elementary schools part time. And we have one just judicial enforcement officer who takes care of, of court duties. Specialized patrol budget is 96%, which covers 16 employees. Um, they have 1%, actually it should be less than 1%, is uh, fees and, and some memberships for some different organizations they belong to. 3.5% um, covers, this is where our canine unit falls, and also I didn't mention telecoms under there also. Um, we have some canine expenses, and uh, since our training unit falls under there too, we have some ammo costs and, and different things like that. Support services, telecommunications, and our beautiful new telecommunication building. 74% um, of their costs go to personnel. They've got 17 employees. 25% uh, covers contracts. They've got uh, the mobile data computer, some of our IT uh, contracts, and 911 equipment. 1% goes to um, some minor equipment and supplies. Good question. Joanne? With your new um, center coming online, have you given yourself a little wiggle room, uh, a buffer per se, of expenses you're not thinking of with this new 911 center, or do you feel pretty positive that you're, you're set okay? Um, Mayor, council members, we're fairly positive. We've been very conservative with the estimates on utilities, cleaning crew. We've reached out to facilities for an estimate for us. Uh, taken into account office supplies, transition items like that, larger storage areas. We've even taken into account some reductions in with the new equipment. It used to be a lot to maintain the old stuff, applied the savings there. So we're, we're fairly confident on our estimate being conservative, okay. but time will tell. I just want to make sure there's <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, under support services, we have community services. Go ahead. 91% um, of their cost is personnel. Um, they have a few contracts, and all of our hiring process, our background process, our polygraphs and psych testing uh, fall under there. And they have 2% set aside. Our volunteers, our explorer programs um, all fall under there. I have a question. Yes. Do Molly? Have, Chief, do you have to pay for uh, fingerprinting? Is that for the, your volunteers? I know it goes through DPS, but. Yeah, our, our volunteers do the fingerprints now. Okay. And then they're sent in. I don't, I don't. The, the cost of it, if the citizen comes in or somebody comes in for a fingerprint card, that cost is usually borne by the applicant. Oh, I know that. I'm talking about our volunteers. Is, do you have money in there? To are, you, are we supporting volunteer programs? Yeah. To fingerprint them. Fingerprint yeah. people. Yeah. Operational okay. expenses, ink, cards, um, that's all. We support yeah. all of their time is free to us. So okay. are you are you asking are they paid or are they? Well, they don't no. I just understand. want to make sure that we have money to uh, get fingerprints on people who want to volunteer and not tell them that we don't have enough budgeted, so we can't have any volunteers because I know it costs money. Mm -hmm. For all of our applications process and recruitment expenses, that is funded since the volunteers and police service is a it's an operational program in the police department. We do have funds set aside for that. Okay, I just want to make sure that's you have budgeted, enough. just like everything else. Like yeah, everything else, okay. like the Explorer program, the VIP program, we okay. have yeah. All right. the operational funds to sustain them. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Thank you, Mayor. Bill. We've kind of gone through everything in the in the budget, if you will. Are there the? Um, can you identify what might be the top three or five? budgeted item, line items in your budget? Is there a, or is it completely blown apart by each one of your divisions? How, how's that laid out? What we've tried to do with the police department is get economies of scale when it comes to contract administration, fuel. There, there are things that touch every division that we centrally administer in the 2110, the Office of the Chief Budget. The major components of our budget are Salary and personnel, that is separated, but it's very easy to pull that out. Um, second, 
highest cost would be vehicles, parts, labor, fuel is the second largest portion, and then all of the contracts that we maintain with Sonoran Valley, the Advocacy Center booking contracts. So those three major categories take up almost all of the police department budget. We need, we need people and cars to do our calls for service and investigate our crimes, and then contracts uh, shore up the rest. Sherry? Is this one on? Yeah, it's on. Uh, w with the booking fees, if we get reimbursed from the individual to the court, does that go back into your budget, or whose budget does that go back to reimbursement go into? But general fund, it does not offset specific PD. Budget. Okay, so, but you have to pay them out of your budget. Correct. That, that doesn't seem... It's an accounting issue. Okay, yeah, it seems a little odd that you're, you're, it's going out of your budget, but then it's coming back in to the general fund. Could the city manager, the uh, city manager <laughs> yeah. address that, please? Well, I, I'll address it uh, perhaps another way. Um, that's not uncommon. Uh, for example, but development services, when you have uh, okay. building permits and all those revenues that come in, that's much greater than the actual cost is um, to uh, provide that service. So it goes into general fund, then it's allocated throughout all departments. So it really is, it's not uncommon for that to happen. And then to try and, and back to uh, the Vice Mayor's point, it is um, the accounting um, that's why requirements. Is the that's accounting. right. The accounting <laughs> requirements are such that it, it has to be set up that way as well. Um, I don't know if Larry wants to add to that. If you have, want some more depth to it, we can have uh, him. Not, talk not really about more depth. I'm just curious: Are we getting a lot of it back, or is it coming back somewhere? Larry, do you uh, want? Is there anything up that you could add that to this conversation? Value. Yeah. <laughs> I trust you. Are we recouping it somewhere in some line item somewhere else? You know, and I think Brian kind of touched on it a little bit. What I would say on that, when you get down to the specific process, are we recouping it? You'd have to get into all of the officer time and that, and I'm willing to bet that we're not recouping the fees involved for it. But I also want to point out on the specific question of why does that revenue go into the general fund. The general fund pays for the police department. It's a trended revenue. So we compare what we're receiving in those year to year. And so that trending takes place. And yes, in effect, we get paid that part. But as Brian said, you know, of most of the budget that you see in the police department, the vast majority of it is not a user fee like that, but it is tax revenue that supports the vast majority of it. Okay, I just Does that curious. answer? Yeah, I was just more, I was interested not just the officer's time, but just like the money to book them in that we paid in Maricopa County, are we getting that back on the back end somewhere in the city? In the long term, absolutely. Okay. And then I... Thank you, Larry. I just oh, have another one, quick question. Yeah, Sherry, go ahead, continue. Um, I know one issue that's been coming up for several years has been the cars, the replacement, are we doing okay with that now? I know we've been replacing, how are we doing with that? Are we, I mean, where are we with that? From a police department perspective, yes. it's been a very good, um, we've reached some equilibrium. Without the years of replacement, we had to sustain some vehicles longer than their life. Than their life. <laughs> and we lost some before they hit replacement. And with the final purchase of the replacements for this fiscal year, I think I think we're doing good. We have plenty of spares on the spare line to sustain our fleet where we don't have officer downtime. Uh, we're not killing the fleet shop anymore with work, and things are things are certainly looking up there. We've got that. We're doing much better. Yeah. Okay. Thank That's you. That's nice to hear. It truly really is. Any other questions? Go ahead. As far as our supplementals, um, we received ten thousand dollars for building improvement repairs, and what this was, this was before. A new evidence building was a thought. Um, back a year and a half or so ago, the idea was maybe we have to expand into the old telecom building, um, which would have still given us, you know, not, would have not given us the room we needed. But um, so that money was dedicated to upfitting that facility to house evidence. Um, obviously, that's not the direction we're going, um, and so that ten thousand will be incorporated into the new building. We had seven thousand dollars for some computer supplies and equipments for a new position that we were that we got last year, a records analyst. We had seventy-six thousand uh, dollars for building remodel, and we have a vehicle impound lot out by wastewater. Um, we carry anywhere from twenty to thirty 
impounded vehicles in there at all times. Keep in mind some of those are, are connected to crimes, vehicular homicides and things, and again, we're going to have to keep them forever. Um, we're just stuck with them. But uh, our towing process, we tow cars daily, we release cars daily, so it's an ongoing process. But we need more space, so um, <clears throat> this money will be to upfit the old fleet facility. When fleet moves out to the new facility, we will use this to uh, upfit that and put our vehicles there. We had seventy-five thousand dollars. Bill, chief, I'm sorry. The um, the impound yard. Uh, we're going to wait to take over the old fleet. What's going to be the old fleet yes. facility? Is there going to be a need for us to do anything at that facility that is going to come up in the future? That you know, last year we went through this. We need to do building improvements for the evidence building, and then we figured out we need a new evidence building. I would hate for us to continue to carry over something if we know already know that that isn't going to be sufficient. Is that going to be talking about the current facility or the new, the old fleet facility, the one we're moving into? Your new <laughs> facility, let's just say it that way. Your new impound yard. Yes, the the money dedicated to that should uh, take us well into the future. That will provide us plenty of space. That seventy six thousand dollars will will outfit that, alarm that, secure that facility exactly how we need it, and there shouldn't be any additional cost down the road okay. for a while. Thank you. Go ahead. We have um, $75,000, which, which is going to be a carryover. The work is not done. It's in process uh, with our new world systems upgrade for all of our records management and, and computer uh, operations. And then we have 100000 in overtime pay. And um, I can tell you that, as you know, overtime is a challenge. Uh, we've talked before about all the different reasons that we've really uh, our overtime has been trending high this year. Our narcotics unit has been doing a great job. Our SWAT team has had more call-outs. We've had, you know, more violent crime of various types. Our telecommunication had vacancies. And we also have several vacancies in patrol. Um, we actually have a lieutenant, five officers, and, and the one dispatch opening right now that we're trying to fill. And I will tell you that filling positions has been a challenge. So in the two and a half years I've done, I've been here, we've probably done six recruitment. And it's it, the preferences that when you advertise for police officers, we want lateral officers. Because if you don't, you're talking about a training. year at least to get new officers up and running through the academy and trained. So we, we, we go out for lateral officers. We have anywhere from 30 to 35 apply. You know, several don't show up for the testing, but, you know, some don't make it through the different processes. We have a very thorough background. Some don't make it through that. And by the time it's done, we just got through doing one. We have five positions, and we're already down to five on our list. And that's before the polygraph and the psych, and I'm sure we're going to lose one or two. So it has been a challenge. Next time, I think we're going to have to go out for maybe there's a lot of recruits and academies that have self-sponsored their way through and paid their own way. I think that's our next option to look at those people so at least it's not a huge amount of time before we get them into service. So that, that's the idea there. But our overtime is... Wally, I'm sorry, Wally. Uh, I have a question. Chief, have you... I don't want to say it that way. Let's see. How about us thinking about getting license plate readers? Has that been a conversation? And also personal cameras on our officers for protection and for them. I mean, we, we have. I know we've got dash cameras, but that doesn't help the officer when he's out of that vehicle. No, we, we have done testing on body cams. Um, there are a lot of agencies across the country going to those. Mm -hmm. um, there is a cost. There are some other issues associated with doing that. We have looked at that and are looking at that. Okay, good. Um, license plate readers, um, there's significant IT issues that go with those and, and, and getting those in place. Um, that is something, you know, as we go into the future and, and as far as technology and things that we want to look at. Oh, great. So, great. Okay, thank we you. We are going that direction. Bill? Chief, I want to take us back to the overtime question. This may be more for Kim and the city manager. I think that 100000 was a... Uh, one time we paid with one time monies. Yes. For, for can you speak closer to that microphone because I know they're not going to pick you up on this. Yes, um, Councilmember Stipp, you're correct. It was one time money this year, uh, and it was specifically to 
um, address the challenge that with the police department was facing, but also evaluate uh, the ongoing need for that overtime and kind of what those trends were showing. But this year in this budget is one-time money. Which, for me, I thought was a pretty um, solid way to manage that because if we didn't have the major cases that we have and, the, and if we didn't have the narcotics issues and that money theoretically would not have been maybe necessarily spent. So I, I don't know if it's coming forward now as a increase to the base budget for this next fiscal year, if we're going to do it again in a supplemental. Um, where are we at with? Yes, um, as part of the supplemental process and developing those recommendations, uh, the police department did conduct an analysis of those crime trends and calls for service and you will see a recommendation coming forward in the next year's budget for, to establish that in the base. To put it in the base. Right. Okay. Continue, Bill. You have another no, question? No, uh, it, it's probably best asked uh, offline. Sherry? When we're talking about the hiring, um, I know we haven't really hired or in increased the force, I know since you've been here and, and really since I think the recession. How are we doing um, workload wise? I mean, because we're talking about, you know, obviously overtime and, and workload. How are we doing with that? And are we finding ourselves when we're talking about looking for even officers from other departments lateral, are we finding that we're competitive or are we having any other issues that are coming up? We're, we're we're pretty competitive with other departments. In fact, the ones that we've lost have either been to, they're moving to different locations to be closer to family. Mm -hmm. There was a retirement. Um, we've had a couple of discipline issues. So, but, but it's things like that. It's not necessarily I'm leaving because somebody else pays better. Good. So, um, you know, we're doing good as far as that. We're, we're very competitive. In fact, there's more officers wanting to come here from other jurisdictions than, you know, are wanting to leave. So I'm sorry that there's another part of your question. Sorry, the other part was is we haven't increased the force or the patrol and, and our population has continued to increase, although not at the level it was. How are you the officers, especially I, I'm really concerned about the patrol officers and their workload, the ability to, you know, take a day off and, you know, not feel stressed and stress the other officers who are on that shift? It's, it's, we're doing well, but it's a challenge sometimes. You know, being down five officers, that's pretty much a whole squad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, it has been costing us some overtime lately to come out with minimum staffing. And um, not a lot, but some. So it, it is a challenge. Um, Although, can I just interject songs, John, trying to get, uh, how does it compare to having to hire someone and train them and put them, I mean, for, for a period of time until you can see what the temperature of the community is. I'm, I'm just throwing that out to you. So, it, you know, it's always nice to hire. You, you need to hire them, but um, there's a cost to it. So uh, we're all still under somewhat of a budget. Yeah. And so we have to be careful, but mainly we want our citizens to be safe. That's uh, what I want to know how yeah. they're doing. And how so I guess the doing. safety issue is, I guess, would be yes, most the, paramount. Yes, I, I can tell you and reassure you that, that our community is very safe. Okay. And I say that all the time up here, and we are. Our, our crime is, is trending about even, which I think is normal. I think, I think some communities are actually rising a bit. Um, we're doing very well. Um, you know, we... we We've done some staffing studies and, we, and we've looked at numbers of officers and we've looked at several different factors. Um, you know, you, I know we've asked for a couple this coming year, um, but uh, we're doing we're doing fine and the community is very safe. Thank you, Joanne. On that, um, your department's the one that got through on the book, <laughs> and uh, I did notice that when it came to I know you're probably going to be getting to it the with your performance measures. Um, being our officers being able to be proactive has has decreased because of more calls, and um, and obviously that's that's concerning because we want them to be proactive. And uh, and I was going to ask if you had put in for more officers because of that. Um, the other question I had was, you know, I, I understand looking for current police officers within other departments, uh, but I was wondering where veterans fall into that play you know of, of looking at are there are there skill sets 
that some of, some of our military vets have that we can, whether they're um, sworn or unsworn, that we'll be able to take on. Yeah, we, we always encourage our, our, encourage our vets to, to apply. Uh, we have hired um, some military persons. Uh, one of our most recent officer hired was a, was a uh, individual that was in the military. So, so we do, you know, we do look to that. That's, that's a good thing. And, um, you know, they, there are quite a few military people that are sworn officers already that can apply for the jobs. So, but to answer your other question, too, about performance measures, we're going to get to that discussion that. coming up okay. in, in a future slide. And, um, yeah, we've been able to do some things to reduce calls for service, but the proactive time for officers is down. Okay. And uh, we'll discuss some of the reasons why right. here shortly. Just and the other thing, Tran, just to assure you that we work with the base. I know I've had economic development, and I've, I've gone to the city manager, and I've visited the base um, to their transition office. And, um, and they're aware, you know, they're aware of when a job opportunity comes, we make sure we get it put on their computer and send well, it on to great. them. So well, that's great. And I know, is, I know you've been very, the, very But there is a source that. there that uh, if there's anybody in that field, one, one thing that I heard, and, and correct me if this is, is true or not, but one thing I heard where some of our veterans have issue coming through that, and, and it may not be here because we've been looking for current police officers, but um, when they come back from, from their tours of duty, there's some questions, whether it's on the testing or whether it's in the psych evaluations and things like that, that... Um, are kind of uh, against what a veteran's had to come home from. You know, you know, it's things about carrying guns and have you, you know, just, uh, can you fill me in on a little bit on that? Well, yeah, there's sometimes some issues. And keep in mind that, that when we go through our back, background process, really we have to meet post, Arizona post background standards too. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's not, it's not just about our standard, it's the post standards that, that maybe they can't qualify for certain okay. positions. So yeah, sometimes there are issues um, with them coming back. Gotcha. A lot of times our hand are, hands are tied with what we can do. So. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Efficiencies. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time reviewing and it's a constant evaluation of, of our operating procedures and policies. Um, again, we're looking at everything we can do to enhance communication, make us more efficient and effective. And a couple cost-saving um, measures that I want to discuss with you. First of all, you know, our trotter track. Between 2012, <laughs> <laughs> between 2012 and 2013, we were averaging 18 calls a month where we responded off to the trotter track uh, for trespassing, vandalism. It was the big spot. Each of those calls takes two to four officers. Uh, we've had officers injured. We've had cars damaged. They're just dangerous conditions out there. So we work with city management, legal, um, met with the owners who agreed to put six, uh, significant security measures in place, and they did. Um, they took a big step forward. They went out there. They graded all the, all the culverts and the holes. They put extra fencing up. Uh, they did graffiti removal. They did a lot of things. Um, I'm happy to report that since October when this was done, we've only had 23 calls since October, none during February, none during March. So that is a great thing. With, and looking at the officer time and the number of officers, you know, estimating 30 to 45 minutes every time they went out there, um, our estimate is about $16,000 a year in saving of, of officer time. So that was encouraging. Well, we have to thank them for cooperating. Yes, yes. You know. They went out of their way. They were, we were great. thinking of different direction, and okay. so it's good that they came to the table. Mm -hmm. Our police assistance program um, incorporated started two years ago. It really took them a year just to get this program really underway and get it going. Um, from January 1st until now, they've handled 16% of all reports that the police department has taken. And if you think about that, two people handling 16% of, of the workload of the cases is pretty amazing. Um, they write about a thousand reports a year between the two of them. Um, and so our estimates are about $21,000 savings for last year and trending towards about 35000 this year in, uh, in saved officer time. So that's pretty significant. Private, another way, private property crashes. 
Um, we were one of the few agents that, agencies that responded to private property crashes because the state doesn't recognize them. They don't do accident forms for private property crashes. So we stopped going to them. Now, obviously, if our citizens really, really want a police officer, we're going to go. But for most cases, we won't go to them. That um, saved 100 calls per year. Um, our estimate is about $7,000 in saving. We use it as an educational tool. Can our I stop you there? Would you kind of just describe what that means? That, I, that I can means just visualize somebody listening to this at home, and I can hear the outcome of this. So just explain a scenario. Yeah, basically Thank anything you. that's not on a street or roadway. In other words, if, if you have a, a privately owned lot or a piece of land and there's a crash on there, um, that's private property. So, so we won't go if you have you know in the parking lot of Target obviously if there's injuries obviously if there's any issues or anything we're gonna go and we're gonna be there a lot of times we roll up on things but that's not something that we will do an accident report on so just just by and and our dispatchers know that when people call in these they'll they'll explain to them exactly you know why we won't be responding and use that time to educate them on how they can handle you know what they need to do and who they need to call and how they can handle these things so that, that alone has resulted in, in about a $7,000 savings just in time. And lastly, our property and evidence facility. Um, again, we're, we're very excited. This will allow us to be more efficient, more effective, allow us to do our forensics and crime scene um, processing uh, again. And uh, just by having all the extra space is going to allow us to be more efficient in what we do. So that's just an example of, of three or four um, items that have cost savings with them. We did a department reorganization, um, placing functions under two deputy chiefs. It just streamlined the process a little bit. Um, you know, we made our commanders deputy chiefs, uh, not necessarily a promotion, not, same position, just a different title. Um, we were able to put patrol in the same division and the same command as investigations. Seems to be streamlined a little bit now. There's a lot better communication going on. We took our field training program for our new officers and put it over with hiring recruitment, um, which, which has done great things because now the hiring recruitment people take the officers all the way through processing, all the way through hiring, and then all the way through their training until they're totally trained, then they come out to the road. So it seems to work, work very good. We replaced our aging motorcycles with new motorcycles. Um, you know, our BMW motorcycles were out of warranty. It's, there was a cost of about $50,000 a year just in the maintenance and the repairs on those old motorcycles. Mm -hmm. um, the new motorcycles, actually, Victory came out, and one of the things they do that, that's unique is they train your mechanics. So our mechanics were trained on how to repair our bikes. So when our bike needs service, we don't have to drive it to Peoria or Scottsdale or wherever to get it done. It's a time-saving. We take it right to our fleet. They do all the repairs there. The new bikes come with a five-year warranty. Um, other models come with a three and you have to buy extra warranty. So we're estimating that per year about a $12,000 savings and about a one-third. Um, we're going to decrease the downtime by about a third as we have currently on, on the old bikes. Great. That's wonderful. Yes. Mayor. Joe? Again, I really appreciate this. Um, this was one of the areas that I shared with the, guy. the city manager that I wanted to see from the departments on how we were creating additional resources, funds internally. Uh, one of the things I wanted to add, though, uh, you still have the volunteer program, I assume, right? Yes, we do. What, do you have any idea of the dollar savings associated with the volunteer hours that you put over at the police department? Can you get that? Because I'm sure that's quite sizable um, there as well. So it is. Thank PJ you. alone. Yes, I know, <laughs> PJ alone. But I appreciate you creating internal funds for us looking at all these things. And I'm sure the motorcycle, I think you were a little soft on those estimates there because just the fact that you don't have to run it all the way over there to Scottsdale and that five-year warranty is going to save you a lot of money. That's awesome. Bill? Chief, last question. <clears throat> See, I wasn't going to disappoint you tonight. <laughs> Are there, um, are there any new programs that you're considering for the next fiscal year? <clears throat> Look at her smile. All right, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Not exactly. We're doing what we do. Yeah. Continue yeah. on enhancements. I, there's nothing new on the horizon. No significant programs right now. We've put so much in place over the last two and a half years. Um, you know, now, now, even though, again, we're, we're 
we're always looking for new things, and there there are going to be new things. Um, right now, we're just sort of uh, you know going along and making sure all of our programs are, are running well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, we're going to review three performance measures with you, okay. um, which highlight our largest quartile one programs, which is our patrol response and operations. And the first one deals with priority one response times. And keep in mind our priority one is our emergency responses, and we are doing very well. You know, I doubt there are many agencies around the country that can meet this kind of number. Um, we're trending towards right at three minutes. And part of that is because there, there's a decrease. Part of that is because, um, and actually it works both ways, that um, first of all, part of my philosophy is we're all cops. And I think, I think that um, previously it was when an emergency call goes out, the patrol officers on the road go, everybody else it's hears it but doesn't go. <laughs> now detectives, admin people, myself, anybody, when there's an emergency call, Everybody knows to go, gets people there quicker. You know, you've always got staff members, you've always got detectives, you've always got different people driving around that can hear these calls, that can respond. So I think that's, that's one of the, the main reasons. Um, it's had a significant impact, and that's one of the main reasons our, our response times are down. And I'll ask, there's one more. Actually, our, our police assistants, you know, we're handling so many reports, too, that, um, you know, it's freeing up officers, so they're available more, and, um, you know, they're out there. When these calls come in, they don't have to put away all their stuff and leave the scene that they're working and then get in their car and then go. They're already out there. They're driving around. They're, you know, close to these calls. That could be another reason, too. But we're very good in, in that area. The next one deals with proactive patrol time. Um, <clears throat> due to being shorthanded and having the number of vacancies, um, you know, we're, we're busier per officer. So, you know, the trend is down. Our, our officers, 35% is probably where we'd like to be in the ideal situation. You know, if our officers have 35% of their time to go out there and be proactive, it would be great. Um, we're not quite there. Our target was 30% for this year. And again, with um, being sort of shorthanded, we're just we're we're not able to get there. So we're right about twenty five percent. Joe, just a comment. One of the things that I like you're doing, um, I like to see what you're doing, and and uh, I see more of it is if an officer is doing paperwork or breaking or whatever, I've seen them sitting in parking lots in a very visible area, not buried among cars, but very easily recognizable. They're sitting there for as a deterrent for anybody going through that particular shopping center. And I'm sure that's by design, and I, I appreciate you doing that because uh, they're much more visible, at least I'm seeing them. I know you haven't increased your police officers, but I'm seeing them more visible in the community, whether they're sitting in the parking lot, whether they're driving through the neighborhood, so I appreciate that. Thank you. And our last one is calls for service. Um, again, and it, and it sort of relates to the last one, you know, we're trending low. Um, do the lack of time to do proactive patrol. When the officers are out there being proactive, um, they're creating calls for service. Everything they do gets a call for service. So the fact that they don't have that proactive time um, is keeping the calls down. Plus, you know, our booking time downtown has increased. And um, it, it's taking three to four hours every time we have to take a prisoner down. Um, that's taking our officers off the road. They have went to a first come, uh, first serve, system and uh, what happens is that occasion we'll have an officer with one prisoner go there and their transport people will come in with 10 where we wait till the 10 are done um, so that's 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 an example so it's a time issue um, you know we've done things also to reduce calls for service we talked about the trotter track we talked about the private property crashes um, our alarms are down about 22 percent so there's things that we have done also to reduce calls for service Mayor, just, uh, just a moment. Uh, Wally, first. Can Councilor you get a copy of your performance slides? 
those three. Absolutely. Are, are, are they in here? Yeah. Yeah. Mayor and Council, right. the, the performance yeah. measures were added this oh, week, and so what we'll do is we can print out hard copies of those slides for you, and you can add those to your binder. Yeah, we can yes. them in our book. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Joe, Joe I think we're going to Bill. Thank you, Sorry. Joe. And me. Yeah. You have more than three performance measures, correct? Yes. Can we get the list of all of them? Certainly. Is that possible? That Absolutely. Came, I think that's what I, my initial question was. Let's just not pick three random, let, let's just see what they all, what they all look like. So perhaps a list of all of them so we all know what we're measuring, what's being measured. Absolutely. The um, city stat team is actually working on compiling the third quarter update. And so we're going through all the numbers and analysis as we speak. So that. I'm sure we'll talk about so it. So for everybody. A list for everybody. A list is going to be something that's fairly easy to accomplish. Okay. And these three were chosen as a reflection of our largest program. Okay. Thanks. Joe? Just to follow up, something kind of stuck with me when you mentioned about the alarms. False alarms are down. Is there something specifically that you're doing? Because I, I know a while back we've had a lot of discussions dealing with this and, mm -hmm. and the percentage of them that are false that actually come in and the time it took police officers to make those calls. Um, are you comfortable with our process in place right now since it's coming down? Because I, I'm reading about more and more jurisdictions that are coming back with various measures to try to deal with those false alarms. And actually, we, we do a measure that requires two phone calls. Okay. So when an alarm comes in, we will call back and verify um, that's an alarm and before we send somebody out. So, there, so there's got to be a follow-up call and many, many times, and this, this is the cause of the reduction, is many times you get somebody that says, oh, it's a false alarm. You wouldn't have known that otherwise, but the fact that, that we've made that second call is, is the big difference. Okay. So. Cheryl Lynn? I was just curious, um, on the uh, measure 195, when we're talking about response time, your target was seven minutes when you'd been uh, the his, historically, it had been over between four and five. Why, why the seven-minute target? That's actually uh, something that had been adopted in the general plan some years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for a police department to say, I'm going to, to have a target response time because there's so much in regards to the community, community makeup, geography, natural obstacles in your path. Um, I believe the seven minutes was adopted, and that was before I had even started as a reasonable effort to have a target and compare ourselves against it. Um, since it does seem high in our recent years, we've always been close to a four. We trend against our previous. We always look at differences between how do we do last month, how do we do the last six months. And seven minutes is just a stated published goal from our general plan when it was first adopted. But we always compare ourselves to very recent past on response time to get a very accurate assessment of how we're doing. Will that change in this general plan? Well, I can imagine my view. It probably yes. is going to change, but I don't know. Can we, as long as we're doing that, can you address that, please? Um, and, and we have someone from General Plan that can address it if they want to come up. But just uh, generally, we're taking out a lot of those targets because it's uh, they will change. And a, ten, a general plan is for 10 years. So it's for those reasons you're starting to take out those. those Katie. Katie's here. I shouldn't even talk. We do have the target in there, but we just say to meet national and local objectives and standards. Okay. Okay. But there's not a time. Good. Thank you, Katie. Sherry? And, and I don't remember, but I know this is, was very good. I don't know when. If it's you that put it up there, when we have started putting the officer up in Australia and keeping one up there, I'm sure that helped with the overall time. But when was that? How long ago was that? That actually was probably at least two and a half years ago. That was before I came. That okay. uh, there was a we were using that as a specific beat where there was always an officer assigned there. Okay, I think it was about three years ago. Okay, right before. Yeah. Sherilyn, were you satisfied? Well, with yes, I, I and I was just curious, and I'm glad to hear that because it really doesn't. It, it, it looks awkward and it doesn't look useful. Yeah, well, I so. guess where it'll be useful in 10 years if it, if our <laughs> you know our uh, population has a big surge again, mm -hmm. you know it will take longer time. So a long 10 year period of time, I mean we we estimate growth, but we're, we're all estimating on you know it could change. But I think Katie's response was right on target. Yeah, yeah. You know, looking at what we're trending and looking at 13 versus 14 makes more sense than to have this thing that was said 10 years ago yeah. that. 
Well, it's an I ego like, thing. You like to do better than what the number is, right? Sure. <laughs> you always try yeah. to do better than that number. Well, but benchmarks are yeah. there for a reason, not just so we can feel good. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Priorities. Okay, priorities for 14 and 15. Obviously, we want to aggressively fight crime, and uh, that's a given. Uh, and continue to use our intelligence so we can be more proactive and look at our data and see what our data tells us. And also our crime prevention efforts and our community policing efforts. We have so many great programs out there. And obviously continuing those and adding new ones as we get the opportunity will be a priority. Um, overtime and staffing analysis, we're always going to monitor our overtime and continue to watch it um, <clears throat> and continue to do that. We'll continue to enhance communication with the public and the community. Again, we spoke about our outreach and uh, we're doing that. Our facilities master planning efforts, um, we, we just kicked off our first meeting um, involving the master plan with the new police building. It's a great thing. Everybody's very excited. We're, we're thrilled with that. So that's one of our priorities. Uh, and develop enhanced training plans for technologies to ensure um, systems they utilize their highest possible benefit. Our new world system is constantly tr tr uh, changing our programs and we're doing a good job keeping our employees trained. Uh, to give you one example, we, all of our cars have the MDCs, the laptops in them. They're very expensive. The trend across the country is to look at the tablets and we're actually evaluating tablets now. They're about three grand cheaper per unit. And um, so we're actually evaluating that now, and that, that's a potential cost saving down the road. And again, because of our new evidence facility, we can refocus our crime scene and forensics program and uh, be more efficient and effective in, in our whole evidence processing function. So with that being said, is there any questions? Questions? I think they asked everything. In the, in the, uh, it was very good. good. Thank you. It's lots of information. We really appreciate it. Um, we still have another one, so I think we have two more. Two more. I think we need to take a break. Uh, I, I was looking at faces; people were twitching a little bit. So we'll take a ten-minute break. It's six ten, so six twenty. Let's be back at the table. All right. Okay, we'll continue with the work session. So we'll start out with the Public Works Division. Mayor, Council, we are going to be providing three speakers today. Would you do me today. a favor and say yes. your names? Yes, public. Bob Beckley, uh, Deputy City Manager. I will have uh, three uh, speakers. We call them the Marks, Mark Flynn. Mark uh, Holmes and Mark Siemens. The Marx Brothers. The Marx yes. the the Brothers. Brothers. Yes. <laughs> Can we like to name <laughs> Couldn't we resist, couldn't we resist <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so our presentation uh, follows, I think you'll see all the presentations follow the same template. We will uh, start with just an overview, talk about the, the organization of the department, some of the strategic plan elements, and each of the managers will be covering their respective areas of uh, the divisions that they're responsible for. So if you can move to strategic, strategic planning. The, and this would uh, represent all of the, the divisions of, of, of municipal services, environmental services, and water resources. In the area of fiscal and resource management, uh, we are engaged with the finance department where we're doing a cost of service for the water and wastewater services. A uh, significant element of that is determining cost of service and how we're providing them today and, and what changes are going to be uh, on tap in the future. The second one is the design of the, the fleet maintenance facility. The, the fleet maintenance services that were, are heavily engaged in, in this effort. 
they're the ones that are given the architect direction after they see their plans as far as what will work, what won't work. Looking at uh, Mark has been very instrumental in uh, coming up with energy savings components and the design of those facilities. So it's uh, both in terms of reducing the cost and also long-term cost. Our asset management program uh, all through the departments will be heavily engaged in coming up with uh, a, a analysis method and an in inventory uh, condition rating of all the assets that we have in the, in the various respective divisions. Water and wastewater are probably the most significant area of value and also the number and the required maintenance on those, those assets. The fourth bullet up there is one that's very critical, and that is the uh, SCADA system. That's the communication system between the head end, the computer at headquarters, and all the various facilities that are located throughout the, the city. It tells pumps when to turn on, when to turn off. It remotely senses uh, operational aspects that are vital to maintaining a, uh, and, and diagnosing problems that uh, happen throughout the system. Uh, we're involved with regional and wastewater and water uh, solutions in cooperation with our neighbors and other partners on multiple fronts and that continues to look for efficiencies and more economical uh, uh, partnerships. Private sector with Newland, we have worked very cooperatively with uh, at Corrigate, the wastewater uh, reclamation facility, in terms of needed repairs that were long overdue that have been completed now, and, and the efficiencies that you'll hear about later are already starting to be realized. The SAD site uh, that was laid dormant has been nearly per at the point of being permitted and we'll be able to use that. Uh, Mark Holmes will touch on uh, that, that uh, activity a little later in the presentation. In the area of economic vitality, we had uh, really the two areas are water resource master planning. Uh, Mark Holmes and his staff has been heavily involved in looking at uh, uh, new water sources, uh, cap water, also looking at inventories that we have currently in the city, what's planned for the city, and how we, we can add to our current su supplies. And then that includes the cap uh, supplies also to be uh, programmed and brought into the city. And then finally, the water conservation uh, strategy throughout the city, both in terms of current facilities and also future design standards are one of the higher uh, priorities of water resources. In a moment, Mark, Mark will go into his organization, but uh, you have municipal services. Uh, Mark is supervising actually three, two, three with consideration of the administrative services uh, supervisor or activity. We have fleet and facilities. So in terms of uh, fleet, uh, we have uh, five, excuse me, we have uh, yeah, five uh, mechanics and one of those being a service advisor. They are the fleet uh, component of our, our department. And you have on the facility side, you'll see uh, those six, uh, six uh, staff uh, handle all the facility maintenance functions. The administrative services supervisor doesn't just supervise municipal services, she assists in all areas of uh, environmental services and also uh, in water resources. Okay. In the organization chart for the environmental services, you'll see a much larger organization. There are, I think, a total of uh, four, uh, 45 uh, in individuals. The supervisory team, the management team, it's almost 50% of the team is either newly promoted or new to the city. We have almost uh, an entire new staff that has been formed under Mark Siemens, and he's done a, a remarkable job in turning the uh, morale, the attitude, and really the, the team ad attitude has really improved greatly, and I think he'll have a couple examples to, to share with you on that. Water resources, uh, Mark Holmes has a staff of three. Uh, Sandra Rodi is the water conservation specialist who also does education. I know in one of our earlier sessions this week, we 
uh, thought it was someone uh, mentioned it was a surprise that we had a, an education component. Sander is very active in that uh, that activity, and with the new uh, additions of Gretchen Irwin, who is planning advisor, helping out in water modeling and work with the, the state, uh, has been very helpful along with Nicole Adamson. In terms of the budget and personnel, it gives a good identity to the. The composition of the department as it relates to the entire budget. Roughly 20% of the city's budget is, is uh, represented in terms of public works. There doesn't include the fleet, which is an internal services fund, meaning that it's billed to each department, the activities for replacement and maintenance of vehicles. Uh, within the budget, the greatest por portion of that budget is 70% of contractual services the materials, the utilities, the electricity, the uh, contracts that we have in terms of making the plants run uh, and, and, and operating and servicing those, those equipment. 30% of the budget is for personnel. Uh, its total is 5.8 million. And in there, there's a multiple div divisions. That's all right, if you want to go there. Uh, the multiple divisions, we, we group the three municipal services under one uh, manager, which is which is Mark uh, Flynn. And then in terms of environmental services, you'll see the various uh, components in sanitation, wastewater, and uh, the water maintenance is under Mark Siemens as, as far as environmental services, and Mark Holmes under water resources as a portion of the water budget. With that, I will turn it over to Mark Flynn. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, a pleasure to be with you this evening. I'm going to talk briefly about municipal services, give you a little bit of background and maybe an opportunity to field any questions that you may have about some of the things that we have going on in that group. Uh, the three divisions that make up municipal services, as Bob mentioned, administration, fleet and equipment management, and facilities. The two largest being fleet and equipment management and the facilities group. We'll start with, with the fleet organization. In the recent efforts, uh, we were able to identify uh, the programs that make up the, the uh, Fleet and Equipment Management Division. We listed a few of those up there for you, and most of them fell into the second and third quartiles. We've highlighted specifically on the second quartile components, but we're heavily involved in the management of the systems that allow for vehicle, vehicle maintenance, the, the components of actual working on the vehicles themselves, the long-term administration, fueling systems, the vehicle replacement program itself uh, and the procurement associated with those we work quite closely with the finance groups for procurement to make sure that we're uh, actively pursuing the opportunity to get good deals for the city in terms of the vehicles that we're replacing and how we go about specifying what those components are but then also dealing with maintenance and repair parts the services acquisition there are a number of components where we're just not equipped to deal with some of those components where we can't do them as well as we could in the private market so some of those services are actually contracted out. The largest area, when you, when you look at the four priorities for council, fiscal and resource management is the largest component that FLEET offers that support vein into. <clears throat> Total budget for our organization within FLEET and equipment management is about just uh, shy of $2,010,000. From a revenue perspective, as Bob mentioned, we are an internal service fund. The work that we do for the city, we're actually billing back to departments. Everything from fuel to labor and parts and pieces are going to maintaining those vehicles. So from that perspective, we always look to keep an eye towards what our costs are and how we can deliver those components in an efficient manner. 30% of the, the fleet budget is focused on personnel. There are six FTE that represent that, that uh, group. 24% of our budget expenditure relates to contractual services. Uh, utilities, maintenance, uh, parts, outsourced labor, as well as some training. We have some very specific training requirements within our group because of the level, level of certification that our mechanics maintain in order to perform those services on behalf of the city. Uh, the largest component though, of, that, of that fiscal responsibility, though, falls into the area of commodities. And fuel is by far the largest component. 46% of our budget is expended on commodities. Over 90% of that are our fuel expenditures. Mark. Yes, sir. Uh, Bill. You may not necessarily know it off the top of your head but can I get a figure for what I'm sorry Bill you're going to have to use that <coughs> sorry microphone. I want to look at him and I want to talk well, in the mic pick it up and look at him then because I can't no, I, <laughs> uh, training budget the training that you expend for not only the fleet 
but uh, the other, can we get a, can I get that info? I, I'd have when to get have, back to you with regard to that, but yeah, I'd be happy fine. to do so, uh, both for fleet and facility. Yeah, and very honestly, for the manager and Tim's perspective, I'm going to ask that of every department going forward. Joanne? So you have um, your enterprise funds, uh, sanitation, wastewater, and water uh, broken out. But you, but you don't have, right. They are they should be, work. yes, yes. But you don't have ballpark, and yet up here you have that listed in your facilities. So where within here, is it under facilities general fund? Where do you have the ballpark within this budget? The, the facilities group and the, the fleet and equipment management division, th those two divisions provide support to the ballpark as we do to all city departments. The ballpark itself, though, is administered through the, the parks and recreation budget. I provide Through their budget. Okay. Uh, it is. I provide support to them in the facility maintenance that occurs at the buildings that are building specific. In other words, maintenance and repair to the structure, the parking lots. As a matter of fact, I'll talk a little bit about some of our efficiencies and a little bit about some of the things we've done in the last year in order to prolong, to, to extend the life of uh, the life cycle of facilities within the ballpark and the development complexes. From the fleet perspective, we're also working very closely, not only with finance, but with the, the staff, the on-the-ground folks, the, the groundskeepers, the, the staff who are managing landscaping and, and uh, 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 field maintenance and the like at those facilities to make sure that we're including them in our replacement programs for the equipment that they use in support of those activities. Sherry? I'm not, not sure if I answered that question completely. Well, wait, wait one second. I, Go ahead. I, I'm just thinking about it. It's, it's, you know, sometimes I like to see it spelled out more clearly, I guess, of saying this is the percent of what is the ballpark. And, uh, and, I, and maybe that's difficult to do. But um, I, I don't have those numbers with me this evening, okay. but I'm certain that I could back into those for you. Thank you. Certainly. Sherry? I was just wondering, it's kind of the same question. I, I know we've deferred a lot of our fleet maintenance, and you guys have really been, you know, keeping things going longer. How are we doing with the rest of the fleet? We sound like police has gotten kind of back on even keel. How are we doing with the rest of the fleet? I, I, my, my feeling is, is that we're improving. We still have some, some room to go. Our focus has been and consistently has, uh, continues to be on uh, public safety, administration of their fleet components, simply because of the nature of services they provide. One of the things that we've been monitoring and, and one of the, the challenges that we'll address has been preventive maintenance and some replacement components related to the general government vehicles, to those other divisions that we're providing that support for. Those are pieces that we're, we're measuring by feedback we're providing, how quickly we're turning components over, and information we're hearing back from those departments is telling us that we're having a negative impact in some instances on their ability to do their job. Those are pieces that we're trying to balance from the, the standpoint of how we're providing those services and then looking at the ways we're delivering those maintenance services to them to see if there's not some ways we can streamline that and make that a little bit more efficient. I do believe we've made great strides in the last couple of years with regards to replacement across the board and we continue to do so with the allocations that you all have been uh, gracious to provide us. I, I think we've made some great inroads so in the still last couple kind of, of years. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like we're still a little bit behind, but we're kind of catching up slowly. I, I believe we are catching up. Okay. I do. We've had some good years there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Joe? It's probably, this one's probably more for the manager. Uh, I know over time we've been talking about, we have a, a replacement equipment fund, and we've been talking about putting together a capital replacement schedule, you know, depreciation-wise, and I, I don't know if finance was taking a lead on and run, but to see at what part of percentage of that is actually being funded. You know, I mean, 50 or 60. I don't need that answer right now, but where do you feel we are, you know, as far as our schedule of when equipment has to be replaced, the fund that we're putting, the money we're putting aside in that replacement fund, and what percentage of it is being funded? Does that, am I probably clear enough on what I'm trying to get to? I'm going to ask the city manager to respond. That's to a bit, but I want to make sure that. Was that clear enough there, Brian? Yeah, uh, turning the mic back on. Yes, and it's actually okay. in several areas. When you talk about replacement, it is fleet, it's technology, it's right. road maintenance, right. et cetera. So uh, part of the budget that we'll be proposing uh, for Council's consideration is a set-aside for replacement. Um, and we are still going to segregate fleet um, uh, by itself, but uh, we will have that in front of Council. You'll see that as we go okay. through this budget. Okay. Joanne? 
Oh, nothing. I was ju it was just the fact oh. that I recall last few years we've been trying to, you know, put money towards the police. Yeah. So. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. The second division within uh, uh, my portion of uh, public works is the facilities team. Uh, again, looking at their programs, we're, we're kind of dealing with the physical structures of the buildings, uh, the parking lots, the from the foundation kind of through the roof structure. Uh, so we've broken out some of the, uh, the programs that we've identified and where our focuses lie. Uh, building security, uh, HVAC is a, is a large effort for us as it is for every facility entity in the Southwest. Um, a major component for us. Um, electronic access and key control is a piece that we're, we're dealing with on a, on a regular and a frequent basis. And then the, uh, to the, the question raised a little bit earlier about uh, maintenance at the ballpark of the development complexes. We spend a fair amount of time uh, in providing support to them, and it's been a great relationship. They're very good and they're keen about identifying needs within the facility, and we try to get to them with their, at their smallest component. We also have a significant amount of maintenance that we're providing at the at the aquatic center, at the Loma Linda pool. We, we do that mm -hmm. on a regular basis as well. From the, the support, from the, the, the objectives that council has established, the sense of community, quality of life, and fiscal and resource management are probably the prime areas where a facility is offering support to, to those objectives that you all have created. From the financing perspective, when you look at the budget, Total budget within the facilities group is uh, just shy of uh, uh, $2.1 million, about $2,090,000. 29% of that is expended on personnel. 65% of, of that budget are our contractual services. Everything from utilities to building maintenance and repairs. Uh, we are almost completely out of the leasing business. We've closed the lease now with the former library site with the opening of the of the new library here at the Goodyear Municipal Complex, so we're really drawing that to a close. We've been able to work with the finance group in order to close out that portion of the budget, have those costs uh, 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 directed towards how we maintain that facility. And then the smallest portion of our line within the facilities line is actually the commodities cost, shop supplies, fuel, those types of things. Georgia? I, I don't understand that statement that you missed, just said. I'm sorry? Um, Direct which monies to what facility? When you close the library, is that what you're saying? Yes. 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 We, we provided information about the ongoing maintenance costs that we're projecting for the new library in relationship to the least cost that we had with the old library. Showing uh, us a contrast. We, we, drew okay. that, we drew that lease to a close and actually returned the facility to the owner, Strikeout Investments. I believe it was the 20, uh, 28th of February is when we closed that lease. So now we're in the process of trying to establish those components in order to maintain the library with Erin McFarland and her team as they roll in and kind of open up the new facility. Okay, there were just so many pieces to yeah. that that I didn't quite get it all. Because obviously Thank the you. cost is going to go up, the square footage went up, so it, it did we increase, don't have cost yeah. to that. Yeah. So. Uh, a beautiful new facility, it's been a great portion, or a great component to jump into and be able to work on, but certainly a little bit larger than what we had dealt with previously. Of course. Um, the smallest, never think of it. the smallest division within uh, my portion of public works is the administration group. Uh, most all of the, the programs that we're facilitating within it, the administration group, administrative services, are in the fourth quartile. Uh, they're the customer service face of public works. They're the, the, pe the people who are receiving the phone calls when we're getting uh, occasionally questions from the general public or uh, uh, after hours calls that are coming in. We're dealing with the administrative processes in, in order to meet the objectives of the city as well as the pieces with the external relationships that, that uh, we're managing with, with regulatory agencies within the community. And I think as Bob had mentioned, administrative services, while reporting through the chain to me and the municipal services side, we're actually providing support to both municipal or to, or to all three, municipal, environmental services, as well as water resources. A smaller budget within the administrative side, but it's all personnel related. 100% of those costs are all personnel related for the four staff who we use in uh, facilitating that side of the equation. Supplementals that council provided to us within the fiscal 13-14 budget, we only had one supplemental that occurred. It was the provision of a uh, wait, an wait, entry. Excuse on me, you have to stop. I'm Is sorry. Is that picture Forgive what it's going to look like? A, there is a city of Goodyear on this building, <laughs> and, 
and the mayor has put in for that for a long time. And is that a sample, or are you just teasing me? <laughs> mayor? Um, okay, I may jump in on this one. Okay. <laughs> what you're looking at there is a, uh, a graphic representation. It's kind of the conceptual planning process that we, we were theorizing with how we might be able to uh, more, predominant, more prominently identify the main entry to City Hall uh, to, to actually kind of direct folks to kind of facilitate their making their way towards the entry of the building. Uh, signage within the complex, uh, uh, my understanding from folks within the, the building has, has been a bit of a challenge. Folks at Goodyear Financial have told me they get visits from folks looking for APS, looking for city services, and vice versa. Folks walking into City Hall who are also looking for components uh, at the uh, Goodyear Financial Complex for some of the private entities that are located over there. Um, what, what you're seeing, though, is truly a conceptual rendering. I, I do not, like the conceptual Not, or, not or fully vetted out at this you. point, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll, make, I'll talk just about that for a moment as we continue to talk about the supplemental. Uh, okay. We have begun to move forward on trying to make this a reality, and we ran into some specific challenges that really made it somewhat difficult to do. Uh, we had a budget established of about $75,000 in order to do that, but one of the things that we found is in the construction of the City Hall facility, of the building itself, that portion where that, that arc is, is going to band around, is all uh, aluminum storefront. There is no real structural members that are there. It's certainly structurally significant to support the glass and the glazing that's there, but when we looked at adding the signage to the component, there were some real structural questions at rendered to us about how we would be able to anchor that in such a way that it could be securely mounted to the building and not cause us some problems in the long term. Mm. There's also been some move in the last, uh, 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 near, in the near term, about really enhancing the entry to City Hall, to really kind of focus on dressing that up and improving the aesthetics of the entry. When you look at kind of that offset angle component that kind of comes right up adjacent to the parking lot, we've been working with Guileen Oslansky from Parks and Recreation, the Arts and Culture uh, uh, Coordinator for the city. And uh, uh, she's been in, in, in discussions from a conceptual standpoint about what some improvements might be to the overall area. And we've really come to the idea that there may be some value in trying to incorporate these two together. So the public art that was being addressed at City Hall could incorporate some of the components about branding or the identification of City Hall as a component. Eileen was extremely excited about that potential opportunity. Um, I, I, I certainly don't claim any skill in, in that part of the equation. I can kind of make sure we're anchoring right to the right points. The problem I have is maybe the conceptual idea of trying to make it happen. So I think it's been a great merger of those two. And the idea is to take this supplemental from fiscal 13-14 carry that over and combine it with some potential artwork projects that may occur in fiscal 15. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Bill? So are, does that mean we're actually going to see it? I don't want to, this sounds, <laughs> I've already said it too. too does that mean we're actually going to see it then in, in the, the next fiscal year? And I don't mean to sound that disrespectfully. I just, um, <laughs> I think, you know, the mayor's probably been working it from one angle. I know I've been banging on the drum about trying to get some sort of identification to that. Um, and I think we all agree that doing this is really important. So I'd hate for this to get pushed another fiscal year and then because we decided we're going to re-engineer and redesign and then find out we can't actually do it until 16. I'm firmly of the opinion that our focus target is to complete the work in, in fiscal year 15. And, and I think one of the things that we probably did somewhat backwards with the effort towards the, the initial component that you see there was to not necessarily look at some of those structural limitations at, on the front end. You know, the, the idea that it originally had, had begun to, to maybe brand and delineate that front entry focused on pieces that were not structurally mounted to the building. They were freestanding. It'd be components that might be some type of maybe almost like an entry tunnel or some type of a, of a, a screen material that might be used to delineate the entry but not necessarily tie to the building. The change when we went to tie to the building is where we really began to get into some structural concerns. Uh, they were raised to us by two contractors that we had asked to take a look at this job. Both waved the same flag and they said, we, we can build what you want but we're not sure where you're going to anchor it and the idea might be that, that individual supports would be necessary and I think that would really take away from that concept that you see there if we had to come out and, and vertically uh, support that. So the idea was to, to, to kind of reverse our focus, allow the artist to help guide us to the way to, to brand the building, and then be able to address that from the standpoint of materials. 
Um, Manager? And, and just to reinforce, it will be done next fiscal year. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's a short answer. The other is um, we're looking at opportunities for potentially softscape as well. Um, is there an ability to do any kind of softscape landscape, you know, plants or anything like that? Uh, but we are excited about merging in the artwork uh, as well. And the other thing to be very specific about, we will have wayfinding on site and we will have additional signage um, uh, on what Litchfield Road. That's what I was um, the challenge is, is a monument sign that you see out on Van Buren. That's a monument sign for the complex. We only have limited control over what we can do as uh, one building within a larger complex. So working through those <laughs> issues, um, Bob, is there anything else I missed on that? No, that, that's correct. The, the only other thing is con possibly some type of uh, identification of City Hall, similar to what we have over in the Goodyear Municipal Complex. That is very pronounced, and that could be on the Litchfield side. That probably would be more visible to the public to identify the City Hall than either of those monument signs. Joe? Are you saying from an art standpoint, um, and again, I thought it was like concrete slabs when that building was built. So you're telling me where that picture kind of hooks around, that's not concrete. The, the, the concrete that you see in the corner to the left and the right mm -hmm. of the glazing structure, that is actually concrete. It's, it's a tilt-up concrete right, building. Right, that's what I thought. A, okay. There's a structural column in there. But the piece that wraps around the front of the building, like where the entry doors are, mm -hmm. those components are, are satisfactory to support the glazing that's there. That's it. No. And the wind load that would fall on that glazing. Okay. But there was some real skepticism about whether or not we could actually hang something of this magnitude from the front of the building. So when you're talking art, you're talking about something almost supported on the pillars on each side that would dress it up coming in, but would be part of the artscape? Is that what you're kind of thinking? Or? I don't think they know, Joe. Okay. I'll be honest, I, I don't okay. have the answer to that just yet. Uh, uh, guy, uh, the, sorry. This, is the way, this is where we're at right now. Guyleen has, a, we have an order of artists. Mm -hmm. The next artist up has been, been contacted. And what he would like to know is what does, what does the city want in terms of that, that sign? Is it identification? And what we're communicating to them, they wanted to, we want to pronounce where the front entrance is. But more importantly, soften the, 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 the escape, the, the view of that point, and also bring some greenery in there. Mm. But very possibly it could involve uh, uh, terrazzo work. It could, uh, a, a design on the windows. It could, you know, your, your eyes would be driven to that point. So it would be very obvious walking up to that uh, site where the entrance is and you're entering City Hall. Mm. So that's going to be the foundation of really how this thing develops. And as far as signage, the identification, that's all, all, all will be complemented uh, by this artwork that we're proposing. Okay. We, we, Joanne? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, as you, as you enter that complex area, in a sense, the, the whole side of the wall, you know, like where the employee entrance is, I mean, that's kind of an open palette itself right there of things that you could do because that's still visible to the eye as you're walking in. I mean, I, there's, a lot that, area. Yeah, there's a lot that could be done on, on either side of those. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad something is being done. Wally, will we see anything or, or will you all be doing all the picking and choosing? No, no, no. I, I think because of the interest of council, it was our intent to bring that back to council as we have some concepts. So you could weigh in on those concepts, see if we've captured it, see if there's other advice to the artist before we proceed with anything. Okay, thank you. Okay. That's exciting. Yeah, it is. Well, see what happens from a picture. Just be, <laughs> just warning for the next presentation. Do not put a picture there. <laughs> we don't know it because it does cause a lot of excitement if it's something you really dearly want. So I'll, go, I'll cross off the rest Cross that off, please. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, efficiencies within, uh, in particular, uh, fleet and, and fleet and equipment management and facilities. Um, we, we've listed a few of the things that we're ex extremely proud of, uh, accomplished in the last year. Uh, some changes to the uh, mechanical system that provides service into the conference room in City Hall up in room 212. Uh, that room is now completely independent of the, the building system. There's a standalone system that's uh, providing service, uh, both heating and cooling to that facility. We're able to also increase the efficiency rating, the SEER rating of that unit. Okay. We increased it by over 40%. So there's a significant decrease in the amount of electricity it's actually taking to provide heating and cooling into that space. 
been such a short period of time, I don't have the ability to tell you what kind of dollars that's translating into, but the SEER rating increase was dramatic, and we expect to see that translate into some electrical consumption within that building. Uh, Chief Geyer had mentioned a little bit earlier the replacement of the BMW motorcycles. Uh, the uh, traffic patrol, uh, uh, traffic officers uh, were riding BMW motorcycles for the last several years, and they were becoming a, a very cumbersome component for uh, fleet to be able to provide service to those. All that service work was being done by the nearest BMW facility, which is actually in Scottsdale. So it wasn't uncommon for us to lose a day in transition to their shop, a day in transition to have those returned, plus the service time that was occurring. Uh, the uh, evaluation had gone through and the conversion was made to the Victory brand. We have one uh, fleet technician who actually attended a, a service course at their uh, facility in Tucson, and we've got one more scheduled where they're actually coming to Goodyear, and they'll provide that to the entire staff. We've also augmented some, some uh, uh, equipment for the folks in fleet to be able to offer that service to those motorcycles and hopefully do that on a, in a, a little bit shorter-term basis. There's also a, a longer-term warranty with the Victory product. Uh, typically, we were looking at two- to three-year options with most of the manufacturers. Victory has provided us with a five-year uh, warranty on that uh, equipment. Um, you know, one of the pieces that kind of crosses all the components within uh, uh, public works as a whole, but uh, is being managed by uh, uh, the administrative group, has been the uh, kind of the streamlined effort towards our standard operating procedures and our job ha hazard analysis from a safety perspective. There's been a revitalization of the safety committee within public works and it's really netted some very positive results for us. Uh, the number of accidents that we're seeing on, a, on, a rate, on an ongoing basis, as well as the amount of lost productivity time has, has actually dropped considerably. And I think it's a, a, a contribution, uh, a, the contributing factor to that for me is the collaboration with the folks in uh, risk management, with Tim Fisher in particular. But it's also been the opportunity to get all the, uh, the superintendents and the foremen and the, the supervisors involved in the process. And one of the things that's been a godsend to that has been the administrative processing of those pieces with the SharePoint product. It's been a great asset for us to be able to look at those things in a collaborative fashion, turn them much more quickly, and to allow multiple folks to edit and comment in a, in a very, very short time frame. We've uh, seen a decrease in the amount of time it takes us to run that process from start to finish for a, sp for a particular task, and it's really paid us some dividends in being able to roll those features out to staff as a whole. I'm quite proud of not only the work that the folks have done to make those SOPs and JHAs a reality, but the administrative work behind the scene to make sure that that process is streamlined. We've actually now begun to see the citywide committee as well as other departments on the, in the city take advantage of that and use some of that structure in their own applications. So we're quite excited about that. Yeah. Um, we completed a, uh, uh, an enhancement uh, preservation treatment to the parking area in the development complex for the Cleveland Indians. Uh, our preliminary estimate in conjunction with the streets group is we've been able to add about five years of life cycle to that process by making that happen. Uh, we were able to do so. It was about a $9,000 expenditure, but we've actually extended the life dramatically uh, from the standpoint with some, some warranty work that involves some crack sealing as well as uh, rejuvenating the life in the asphalt and then restriping. It uh, really kind of gave us a, a, a new appearance to the area. We'll kinda, our plan is to extend that both to the ballpark as well as to the Indians complex, but we're quite pleased to see that uh, come to fruition this last year. And then the last photograph that you see there is the operational efficiency of the new fire apparatus. We've been, <coughs> excuse me, we've been able to take our operational cost, the cost per mile for those, those uh, trucks to roll, we've been able to reduce it by almost $2 per mile in that operation. We've gone from about $3.65 per mile uh, down to about $1.45, $1.50 right now is our current focus. And uh, when you think about the number of miles that those engines are rolling on a regular basis, that's, they're averaging about 18,000 miles if we were just to focus for where we are right now. We think that number will drop off a little bit through the course of the year, but at a, at a $2 per mile savings in this first year, we think we could realize numbers that are certainly into the $20,000, $20,000 savings mark with regard to that. So we're quite excited to see that. Uh, we're also uh, pleased to be able to offer uh, service to those units on a regular basis, good working relationship with the local representative, as well as enhancing some training for our own folks and able to, to realize some of those things occurring here at the local shop level. From a performance measure standpoint, we've identified uh, three or four uh, different performance measures that we're tracking on, on a regular basis. 
the first one relates to the total direct operating and maintenance cost per square foot of all our maintained facilities. Uh, right now, our target, our goal is about $3.80 a square foot. Uh, we're running slightly under that right now, and our forecast for this year will be about $3.30 per square foot for those maintained components. Uh, but we're also uh, seeing some new things occurring with the expansion of the library and some new buildings are coming on. We monitor those on a monthly basis. We're looking at those costs on a monthly basis and then reporting them through the performance measures project and then reviewing those collectively on a quarterly basis. <coughs> Second one we have up there is the number of vehicles in the fleet that are considered low use. As a city, we have identified a use of less than 300 miles per month as a low use component. Our target is to get that number down in the 10% range. And right now we're running actually a little higher than that. Our, uh, our target, or the goal we attained in uh, uh, actual in calendar 13 was 15% uh, vehicles in that category. Our target right now, based upon our trending analysis, is that we're going to be at about 20%. But that's information we're providing out to directors on a monthly basis. We provide them information about what we're seeing in terms of the use of the vehicle in the last month as well as in the last quarter and then now we're able to produce that report to show them in the last year. Some of that has been as staff have turned over, as, as staff have left the city, perhaps the vehicle sat dormant for a period of time while staff was recruited or in some instances we've had folks who have been out on, on long-term medical leaves or those kinds of things. But it's information we're trying to provide to directors on a more, consistently, uh, more consistent basis to help them understand what's occurring and to help us identify where there might be some opportunities for us to increase efficiency within Joe? the operation. Just a, a general question on the low use. Have you ever looked into like uh, Enterprise or any of the rental cars to see for those that are low use getting rid of the vehicles and try to cut a deal with maybe the rental cars if they use that list to see if there's some savings? Have you explored that option? We, we've begun to do that very thing, yes. Um, you know, we've had discussions with uh, uh, Enterprise as a specific entity about a, a sharing service that they offer as well as the ability to lease those vehicles and maintain them from their facility where they're providing those maintenance services and the like. Uh, the analysis that was done, I, I think the, the latest update is probably about a year out of date by now, but it was uh, uh, not quite financially viable for us to proceed with that at that time based upon some structure and some downtime with regard to how those vehicles would go but it's something that we do look at on a regular basis to try to, to streamline. Okay. We're also trying to identify some specific targets within the fleet about some specific vehicle types that might be uh, uh, viable for that type of a program to help us maybe refine that and, and uh, fine-tune that just a little bit. Charlie, my question is what departments are, are the ones that have the, the less than 300 miles a month? I, I don't have that information here with me, but I, I could provide that report for you and show you that. Um, you know, typically we're seeing that, uh, um, I, I think, uh, from the perspective, uh, I'm trying to think of the last data that I had reviewed, which would have been the, the closure in March. Um, we had some components in uh, uh, engineering that was tied to some staff who had re retired, uh, who were no longer working, and replacement for those staff were occurring. Uh, I think I have a couple of uh, individuals, perhaps in the uh, uh, fire department, who we're out on some medical leave where some vehicles weren't being utilized <coughs> as a result of, of them, them being uh, having not been replaced or someone assuming their duties for that period of time. So we, we tried to provide that information back to the directors to help them provide us some rationale as to why that might be occurring. And then if, if it's just that there isn't a need for the vehicle, we're looking to repurpose accordingly to provide the, uh, to make sure that we're getting the best use out of those components to the best of our ability. Did you know, have any idea how many? I, I, well, I mean, when I, when I look at the, the trending number, our target is about 10% is the, is the target we're shooting for. That would be about 30, 32 vehicles that we'll be looking at. Uh, if our trend analysis is correct and we're on target for 20, that would double that to about 60 units right now. Okay. Sherry? This is a little bit different. This is more in the buildings. We hear and you see the solar popping up at all the schools and a lot of other businesses. Is that something... And I don't know if this is really cost efficient or is this something we've looked at or we could look at or is it not even cost efficient really for the city? Um, it, it is something that we, we look at and we continue to look at with, with some regularity. Um, there is a, a, some components associated with regulations within the market about tying the load of power that you're generating to where it's being consumed. The idea of net metering, just producing and being able to aggregate against our entire electrical load is not something that is currently viable within the state of Arizona. 
So we're trying to match loads for what we could produce, how much, how many uh, square feet of roof space, how, many, how much uh, roof space I could devote to photovoltaic generation, uh, and then trying to tie that to the loads within those buildings and, and deal with that accordingly. We're certainly trying to look at that with new buildings that we're bringing online so that we can have some influence on how the building is designed. Quite a few of our facilities have rooftop mechanical units, heating and cooling that's actually up on the rooftop, so that, that negates the ability to have perhaps the maximum amount of, of uh, PV array that's in those locations. We've been looking at components like the, uh, the shade structures yeah. that exist at the uh, City Hall facility, uh, as well as in some other locations. Uh, the park and ride was actually designed for that, but we have no real electrical load of that component beyond the lighting that's consumed there. The, the building is so small it doesn't really consume a lot of electricity. Uh, but we've been looking at some opportunities where we might be able to partner with folks where they might be able to come in and provide that as a third party and allow some of those things to come to the benefit of the city. There, there is some value, but there is some analysis based upon how you're going to structure that in the, for the long-term deal, for the long-term debt that would be associated with that. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the last performance measure uh, that we had listed uh, deals with uh, technicians' billable time, the amount, total number of billable hours that we're tracking for those individuals. This uh, specifically addresses uh, the fleet mechanics. Our goal for that group of individuals is uh, what we call we call wrench time. We're, we're targeting 70% uh, wrench time uh, for their efforts and and. Uh, we're actually looking at right now at the ability or the need to pretend to bump that up a little bit. We've been able to attain that with some consistency the last couple of years, and we're looking to potentially increase that just a little bit. But when we think about the range time that's involved, it's the amount of time the mechanic can actually spend logged on to and involved in performance of their duties. We actually log on on the computer when they start a work request, they log off when they're complete, and then an email is generated to the user of that vehicle to let them know that that work is, com is completed. By doing so, that's how we're tracking the time, the parts, the materials that are used in facilitating that repair. That's a, a component for us as part of our longer-term tracking system. But uh, as a general average across the mechanics that exist within uh, fleet and equipment management right now, we're tracking at about 75% for the last couple of fiscal years. Uh, some challenges that we're, we're uh, trying to tackle as we roll into the next fiscal year. Um, we've been actively involved with the clerk's office in really cleaning up and streamlining our records retention within Public Works. With uh, the merger with Public Works into the Water Resources Group to create the, the larger Public Works entity, we had a couple of different sets of records. We had some duplication of records that we've been able to try to streamline. Also, just the alignment of policies to make sure that we're doing the same kinds of things across the board. That's been a, a, a tremendous process for us, and, and the clerk has given us some tremendous feedback and support and really trying to streamline that to make that process a reality. Uh, for the facilities group, uh, building automation and control. As we look at ways to, to streamline and with the advent of some new buildings coming online, we're looking at trying to incorporate building auto automation and centralized control so that we could retard temperatures in buildings with nighttime set points, retard, raise the temperature in this building when, when this meeting has ended without having to go around to individual thermostats, but by doing so with an automated control that's connected to a computer somewhere as well as retrofitting some of those technologies in some of our older buildings, where we know there are some pretty set patterns of how the building operates, start times, start times, when there are after hours meetings and the like, to maybe focus in on some of those areas for control. Um, we're also dealing with an increasing workload, you know, as we're, as we're increasing our building inventory. The expansion of the library, the increased facility, Fleet is in a comparable com position. We're going from a, a building where they're going to actually increase the amount of space uh, dedicated to that, uh, the uh, the larger fueling site that we'll see, we provide a little bit of support to the to the entity in order to make sure that we can maintain the the fueling systems of, uh, associated with that. The evidence storage that po the police department is involved in right now, and then the reuse of some of those other buildings because they vacate those spaces. We want to make sure that we're making good decisions about what those buildings are being utilized for, and then how we're maintaining them so that the next person coming in, the next department, the next division they're also getting as high a quality product as we can potentially deliver. Uh, aging building systems infrastructure is an issue for us as well. You know, be that uh, the, uh, uh, the distribution systems that exist within a building, uh, the equipment, the gear, the lighting, the, the uh, distribution wiring, those types of things that are occurring, aging mechanical systems, air conditioning, heating and the like, those are always pieces that we're, we're uh, uh, 
we're, we're in the follow-up game. We're trying to make sure that we're trying to get the most life out of those pieces that we can for the long term. And as we all know, those pieces are getting a little bit older for us. Fleet and equipment management. I mentioned a little bit earlier about addressing the backlog of pre preventive maintenance for fleet units, in particular for, for general government. There's always that focus on public safety to make sure that we can keep their units rolling. But the idea about making sure that we're meeting the needs of water and wastewater, of parks, of streets, uh, they're, they're all now tied in a much heavier fashion to equipment that they're using to get their job done. The boom trucks to reach the, the, uh, the street lights or the traffic signals and those kinds of things. It's important that we're turning those things for them on a as timely basis as possible. So that's a focus effort for us. Enhancement of the reporting to the user group. I mentioned a little bit about like the, the low use reporting. We're also trying to streamline some of our reporting components to show folks how much a specific vehicle is costing them on, a, on an annual basis when it comes in for service. Here are the things that we've done. It came in for a, for a PM level one service. We also found these two other problems while it was here, and we've taken care of those while it's here. Here are the associated costs that went along with that. So those are pieces that we're trying to, to really enhance the data we can provide to folks on, a, on an ongoing and consistent basis. Forecasting the uh, opportunity for fleet replacement. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Pozzillo mentioned the, the comment earlier about uh, how we're forecasting what those pieces are making sure that we're funding properly to address those issues. From our perspective, it's making sure we have the right resources to meet the needs of those departments and divisions, but also doing so in the, on the, the, uh, uh, the ability and coordination with finance to say, here's what we think these costs will be on a year-to-year -year basis, given the criteria we're using to analyze that. And then when an accident occurs or when a major service occurs, adjusting that program accordingly based upon what it is that we're seeing. And then the final one that we show there is just an increasing workload that's resulting from an aging fleet and expansion of the fleet. You know, the increased workload associated with those motorcycles for the police department. We're excited about being able to provide the service, but we want to make sure that we have the work, the, uh, the staffing load to be able to accommodate that need on their behalf. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes you can, Molly. Thank you. How big is the backlog for your preventative maintenance? And do you feel that you're going to be able to accomplish catching up? Uh, I, I do feel like we're going to be able to accomplish that. Um, you know, when, when I analyze our uh, fleet availability records, you know, our targets are pretty high. We're running at uh, about 95% as our target goal. And uh, I, I've done a, a significant amount of comparison from 2008 uh, to, to uh, 2013, fiscal 14. Uh, when we were looking at that. And our numbers are running slightly below that 95% mark right now. I think for general government, I'm down around 93%. And I think for public safety, I'm running right at about 95 or maybe just a shade under that. I have to go back and double check those numbers to be sure. But our, our objective is to try to be able to allow us to recover those numbers by forecasting, by utilizing some of our scheduling components to, to uh, let folks know in advance when preventive maintenance is due and then give them an opportunity over a window of time by which they can bring that, that vehicle to us for service. In particular, that's worked very, very well for us in the last several months with the fire department. We forecast for them on a monthly basis and then say, you know, apparatus take a lot of time. We're devoting staff in order to make that happen. So we're really trying to, to carve out a section of time for them to bring that in. If we get it at 8 o'clock on Monday, we're going to try to turn it for you by this time. And we're able to try to hit, we're, we're hitting those uh, more often than not with regard to our ability to make that happen. But I don't have those exact quantity numbers based upon the, the specific number of units in the fleet. Some priorities for us coming into the fiscal 14, or fiscal 15, the 14-15 calendar, that decreasing that backload of preventive maintenance. Our, our, uh, our target, our objective is to try to come up with some ways for us to streamline that by some better scheduling, by some more efficient use, and by, by kind of uh, focusing on the efforts to make sure that we're seeing those vehicles when they're necessary and not allowing them to actually fall into a deferred standpoint. Uh, the completion of the facilities master plan we think will allow us to enhance some planning to uh, address facilities needs for uh, on behalf of all the divisions and departments across the city by dealing with not only what we need as we continue to grow, but how we can utilize the buildings that are being vacated, that, that are, are being, uh, 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 as folks are moving into to new facilities, what are we doing those facilities that they're vacating? How could they be repurposed for the best needs of the city? Uh, the establishment of uh, some higher quality air conditioning redundancy in the ITS server room. Uh, we really expanded the server room about two and a half years ago. 
it's important to us that we have the redundancy to that system so the event of either some plan maintenance or, or having a bit of failure, if we were to lose power or something for a long-term basis or have a mechanical failure in that system, computing is such a high component of all the departments and divisions now, we want to make sure that that redundancy is, is uh, significantly adequate to address that need. <coughs> And then asset management, uh, the asset management programs that we manage on behalf of the city, fleet and facilities, fine tuning and prioritizing maintenance and repair that's coming about as new facilities are added, establishing those programs from the inception of the building, forecasting what those pieces are, using that to build our, our, uh, our workload, uh, what our work plan is for the year, and then making sure that we're hitting the milestones that are either manufacturers or best practices represented to, to uh, try to extend the life of those facilities to the longest term possible. Um, and if I may, Mayor? Yes. The one item on their facilities master plan, this is, uh, we feel it's very important for us to look out 10 years and even longer, uh, if you will, as far as future facilities. How long will our current city hall last us? Um, growth uh, of, city, of our residents um, and also our, our staffing. And look at what we do with um, this set of buildings after uh, after we move out and those types of things. So it is going to be a very comprehensive look because right now um, we're, uh, we, um, we don't have to worry about it today, but we absolutely have to be planning about it uh, for tomorrow. So that will be a, a supplemental that we put in front of you. Thank you. And this is other questions for me. I'm going to defer As to always the, a very thorough to, to presentation. Thank you. No more questions? Bro? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very so much. Now, uh, we're on environmental services. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mayor and Council Members, good evening. Good I'm evening. Mark Samens. I'm the Environmental Services Manager. And tonight I'll be talking to you about sanitation, wastewater, and water. start off tonight with sanitation. Um, as you see, we have uh, four projects uh, mostly residing in the second quartile of the uh, priority-based uh, budgeting. Uh, residential curbside collection, house, household hazardous waste events, bulk waste removal, and customer service. Um, these will all support the quality of life and fiscal resource management goals of the council. Um, just talk about briefly about the uh, residential curbside collection. Uh, currently, we have approximately 24,108 accounts that we service. Um, we do collect uh, trash twice a week, uh, one um, residential and one recycling. And then we uh, maintain a compliance issue with the county by inspecting approximately 25% of all the containers annually. And to date, we have remained in compliance with the county on that. Um, our household hazardous waste, we hold two events a year. We sponsor one of those events in the fall, and then we participate in the spring event, which just occurred in Avondale um, earlier this month. In the fall event, we had 488 vehicles that came through, and we collected approximately 10 tons of material. And at the Avondale spring event, uh, there were 327 vehicles, 166 were from Goodyear, and we don't have the totals yet as to how much was collected of that one. It typically wow. takes about 30 to 45 days to get that. Quick cool question. Joanne? Mark, on that, um, you know, I know in the last couple of years, Lockheed had done a uh, electronic um, recycling right. event. Now that they will no longer be around, I wonder if that's something that we're going to have to look at in the future to cover. We do incorporate the electronics. Do do that? Yes, okay. ma'am, we do. And we do have an opportunity to uh, actually work with the landfill um, on that on, as a special one if they need it. Okay, thank you. That's part of our program. There. Wally? I, I know that waste management has a bin and that you can drive out there and, yes, and dump your computer parts because I've done it a couple of times whenever I feel like I need to get rid of something. That, that's so that's program ongoing. That we're, we're, yes, ma'am. And that's a wonderful um, service to our residents. It helps a lot. It sure does. Okay. Thank you. Um, with this, the third program that we talk about is the uh, bulk waste and removal. That's our once a month uh, bulk waste program that we're doing. Yes, ma'am. Since you brought that one up, how is, I know we made some changes a couple times throughout. How, how's that going? I mean, from your perspective, is it working okay? It's actually going very well. Um, okay. we, we're very, pretty much successful in uh, providing the city service coverage. Um, we do hit all of our accounts. Um, and as a matter of fact, we have um, 
roughly 26,000 uh, bulk stops this fiscal year, and of that, we've only had about 20 callbacks. So percentage-wise, we're hitting That's greater good. than 99%. Good, huh? So it's, it's been, uh, been a very successful program. It does have its challenges. Um, uh, and, and the largest challenge is with staff continuity. Um, there are, we do operate the program with five FTEs and two temporary staff employees. And uh, the two temporary staffs are, by nature, temporary. And so it takes about 16 weeks to actually get a staff member comfortable with the route so that we can you know, get him out and be efficient at his route. And when you have temporary people, you know, they, they come and go. And that's the nature of temporary. So that's probably our biggest challenge with this bulk program right at the moment. Joe? Follow up on the bulk. Um, any challenges where getting where they're supposed to have them in what four foot sections and stacked? I mean, sometimes even our in my neighborhood, I, I see stuff out there a lot longer than four and all over the road. So, is there any challenge in educating the public? To there, there are those, in? Councilman, there are those challenges, um, but, but we have a very effective uh, team that goes out and actually works with and communicates with our customers and our residents. Okay. Trying to help them through those issues, we pick up everything that comes I know, out. But and um, you know, but we do try to work with the individual customers, letting them know that there is a size constraint, okay. this and that. But we ultimately we pick up everything that that's asked okay. for. Sherilyn, the other education piece in my neighborhood, they tend to whenever they need it out of their homes, they put it out on the sidewalk, and it just stays there until it's the day so there still needs to be I think a bit of education that there is an appropriate time to put it out and, and, and council member you're absolutely correct and one of the things we do we have the information on our website as to what the, their uh, days are um, individuals can log on to the website and see what days are specifically uh, have for their pickup dates but we do have to we do have to continually get out there and talk to people and, and we're doing the best we can at that are any of these people moving in and out is that when it normally happens or no is that, no just a, <laughs> no okay i think it's just an arbitrary spring cleaning day you know they have the time and the energy and they put it out and of course from my perspective it's very inconvenient because i can't just go down or around the stuff so i it, it it's very noticeable to me that i can't walk the neighborhood <laughs> And, and we do we do get phone calls for that, and we, we go out and try and address those as quickly as we can. Moving on, um, the sanitation budget. Uh, you'll see that our total budget is about $5.3 million. Uh, revenue is at $6.3 million. Uh, the budget difference there would be our transfers out um, that we uh, maintain. 10% of our costs are personnel related, again, to the five FTEs and the two part-time employees. 89% is contractual, and the bulk of that is the waste uh, waste management contract. 1% um, is identified as commodities, covering basically the fuel and safety supplies. Too. I'm going to turn over the next slide to Bob. Um, he's got some comments on that one. Thank you, Mark. This, this slide we wanted to add in at this point because uh, we don't anticipate any change in the monthly charge for sanitation. But we wanted to inform council as far as the trends of the expenditures versus revenue. As you can see on this chart, uh, in 16-17, the expenditure line will uh, exceed the uh, revenue. And that would be the time that we would be coming back to council to talk about a potential increase. Um, these, the expenditure is, is looking at both the residential contract as well as the uh, bulk and all other services that Mark has explained. So at that point in 16, we'll probably begin to come back to council to, to begin that discussion as far as what the needs are, uh, financial needs are, and talk about adjustments. Bill? Bob, we're for 14-15. I'm going to use the color on your chart. We appear to be in the black. Yes. Is that a sufficient sufficient enough of a dollar amount to get us to push this one one year farther away before those lines start to to cross? Yes, we uh, Larry and Kim and our staff both both looked at uh, what does that look like, and I think in fiscal year seventeen it's uh, eleven thousand dollars in the red, but this. That's two years away, so we're, we've been very conservative on our expenditures and our revenue side. So we'll be tracking this each year and then give you an update on this chart to see if it's tracking or if there's uh, any change in what their estimates are. 
Great, thanks. Sherry? When does our contract with waste management come up again? We have uh, two dates in the future. In fiscal year 16, uh, the, pr the responsibility for the maintenance of the containers revert to the city. So that reduces the cost slightly, but we have to bear all the responsibility and costs. The contract is, uh, the term is up in 19, 2019. So that's the date that it would likely be rebid. Go ahead. Okay. Moving on, we'll talk a little bit about our wastewater system. Uh, currently, we uh, quartile one is our, our largest quartile where most of our programs reside. Uh, programs such as wastewater treatment, operations, treatment plant maintenance, regulatory compliance, electrical repair and maintenance, emergency backup generators, our collection system maintenance, uh, basically our sewer mains, our manhole maintenance, and our overall sewer infrastructure. Uh, all of these support quality of life and fiscal resource management goals. Um, talk briefly about the, um, the, the individual uh, elements here. Our wastewater treatment plant, we have three uh, wastewater facilities within the city of Goodyear. The Goodyear facility right now is a four million gallon a day plant and our daily average is right around 3.2 MGD. Corgit uh, down south is uh, 0.8 MGD or 800,000 gallons a day, averaging about 400,000 gallons a day right now. And then the Rainbow Reservoir further down south is 750,000 gallons a day, but averages only 225,000 gallons a day. Um, regulatory compliance, uh, we do have uh, several mandated programs from ADEQ, uh, Environmental De Arizona De Department of Environmental Quality, uh, the EPA, Maricopa County Environmental Services Department, uh, permits and regulatory compliance such as our Act for Protection Plan programs and then our ZIPTIs, our, our uh, surface water discharge uh, elements. So those are regulated compliance issues. Um, briefly, we'll talk about collection maintenance, uh, the collection system maintenance. We're talking about basically hydro cleaning those, uh, those water mains and the force mains um, and trying to prevent uh, sewer overflows. Those are things we don't want to have out here. And then our sewer infrastructure management, um, talking about basically looking at the infrastructure itself, going into those sewer mains, looking at them with cameras to actually see the, the uh, condition of the sewer mains. Moving on, our wastewater budget, um, a total budget right now is $4.3 million. Our revenue coming in is a little over $11 million. Um, the spread between the budget and the revenue, of course, is our CIP projects long-term debt repayments and our transfers out of the, to the general fund. 40% uh, of the uh, cost of this is our uh, 20 FTEs, 36% contractual covering the cost of utilities, maintenance and training, and then 23% is in our commodities such as chemicals, minor equipment, fuel and safety supplies. Moving on to water, <coughs> excuse me, um, again quartile one was our highest uh, number of programs, water treatment, water production, our drinking water quality testing, our water supply, pump station maintenance, our water production maintenance, regulatory compliance, and fire hydrant maintenance and repairs. Again, all supporting the quality of life and resource management. Joanne? Years ago, um, I was su very surprised because <coughs> I had found within our city, um, was, I was doing marathons and I had this track that I was uh, training on and I was noticing how many of um, our landscaped areas the water was just going to nothing. You know, we, we had all these little, little um, spouts everywhere. I wondered um, how often that we do an inventory of, you know, our right of ways and our landscaped areas, all those different things just for water um, issues, just as like that. Yes, ma'am, that's a good point. Um, there were 75, I found, <laughs> on my, I mean, I started counting. <laughs> How long so, ago was right. that? There was a while. Okay. Well, that's what I said. So that's why I'm wondering, you know, since that day, I wondered how often people go out and... The, the, landscape, ir out. the landscape irrigation is traditionally the responsibility of the HOAs and, and the... Um, well, these were ours, unfortunately, so... Uh, ours and our right-of-ways? Yes. And those are managed by the Parks and Recreation Department? Here comes um, here comes Nathan. Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> Saved by Nathan. 
I had it, Nathan. I had it. <laughs> Nathan wants to start training with me, and we'll start looking out there, right? That's right. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, uh, our... Um, our goal is to get around to each of the right-of-way areas at, on a minimum of three times per year. Um, based on uh, the current right-of-way, 26 million uh, square feet, uh, we've been falling short on that uh, to about 2.3 cycles per year. Um, and I look forward to having more discussion with you on that subject tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that intro. We'll be waiting. <laughs> Back to water. Mm -hmm. um, currently we have uh, four treatment facilities within the city of Goodyear. Um, two of those are reverse osmosis, uh, where we take out the salts and the hardness of the water. Um, as a matter of fact, the Bullard Water Campus is a 3.5 million gallon a day. It is the largest public uh, uh, domestic water uh, RO plant in the state of Arizona at the time, so we can be proud of that. Um, we also take out arsenic at two of our different sites. Um, the, the RO plant does take out arsenic, by the way, but specifically targeting uh, arsenic at two other sites for a total of 3.5 million gallons of treatment. Um, our drinking water quality testing um, is basically our process testing as opposed to our natural compliance testing that we do with the state agencies. Um, we're looking at the RO performance. We're looking at the efficiencies of the membranes themselves and ensuring that they are producing what they're supposed to produce. Um, we do have uh, uh, pump station maintenance costs basically relating to our booster stations that deliver the water throughout the city. Our regulatory compliance, again, mandated programs from the uh, ADQ, EPA, on such things as arsenic. Our microbiology, we take about some, roughly 60 samples per month by rule. And then, our, of course, all of our Clean Water Act sampling as well. Um, we have over 100 regulated samples that we take on a monthly basis, and we can uh, ensure that our water quality is, is up to the standards of the EPA and the ADQ. Moving on. The water budget, um, this does not include uh, Mark Holmes' section in the water resources. This is strictly the O&M side. Um, the total budget is uh, $4.57 million, and the total revenue of 12.8. Again, the spread is due to CIP, long-term debt repayment, and transfers out to the general fund. 36% of the uh, per is personnel related to our 22 FTEs. 40% is contractual, covering the utilities and maintenance. And then 24, uh, excuse me, 40 percent to contractual, and then 24 percent to commodities such as chemicals, fuel, and safety supplies. In FY 13-14, we received uh, supplemental uh, funds from the council, which we are very appreciative of. Um, listing those out: uh, Corgate Reclamation Facility O&M type items. Um, we did have a an air blower that we had to replace at Corgate. And that was one of the specific uh, one-time items. Goodyear Reclamation Facility, Rainbow Reclamation Facility, O&M. Uh, we're working towards, uh, you know, in the past several years during the uh, downtimes, we had a lot of deferred maintenance. We're building the maintenance funds back up. Um, we did have a, uh, a step screen replacement at the Rainbow Valley Water Facility. And we did hire an industrial pretreatment inspector this year. So those were supplementals that we were successful in. Quickly, we'll touch on a couple of uh, efficiencies. Uh, one in particular is really uh, two of our efficiencies came from one major project last year, and that was a project that we did in cooperation with Newland at the Corgate Wastewater Facility. It, was, it, it has turned out to be a fantastic thing for us. Um, one of the projects that we did was a filter upgrade. We had old, outdated traveling bridge sand filters. We replaced those with disc filters. What that basically did is reduce the backwash time on those and increase the influent uh, efficiencies by about 20 percent. All of that water went back into the headworks of the plant and no longer has to go back there. That's 20 percent capacity that we gained. The second thing with, uh, from the filters is that we're able to get that water to A plus quality, which now allows us to do several things with it. Either recharge it or the, the targeted use for this water is to go into the lakes at Australia Mountain to actually supplement uh, the uh, non-potable system up there. That's great. For the lake management. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, second efficiency we listed here is uh, basically uh, completing the replacement of 10 fire hydrants that we've identified that were not in service and uh, high priority for us was to get those back in service. So we Joe? got those this year. Sir. 
Just to, just to follow up what you have there on the 20% efficiency on the uh, filters, can you put a dollar amount to that? I know it's going to extend the life, but I would assume there's a cost savings involved in that. There is a cost savings, uh, council member, but it's hard to put it on, on that because what it really did is took water out of the process. But what we did do is in cooperation of the whole project with the Corgate facility is that we were able to, um, with the modifications, especially to our aeration basins, we're saving on electrical demands roughly about $3,500 a month now. Okay. We're reducing costs. So not specifically related to filters, but the overall project is really bringing in about $3,500 a month in savings. That's pretty extraordinary when you think of the, yes, the road you've come on that. Let's do it real quick on the affluent. You say that's getting pumped back into the lake, which is going to be, which is used, I guess, in Australia for um, uh, irrigation? Yes, sir. It's not, being pumped, it's not being pumped in there at this moment. We're still waiting for all the final permits. To be okay, done. but when that happens, what tip, what's the irrigation right now? Regular water, so I assume there's going to be a savings involved for, for the community as a result of that? I'm trying to get a handle on what does that result in? What, what, what has to happen is that the uh, Newland non-potable system, right now they're taking water from groundwater wells. They have to get off those groundwater wells. It was always intended uh, from day one of this plant to produce effluent of a quality to supply water to the lakes to supplement. Um, we don't know right yet, based on demands, if they'll ever be able to get totally off the wells, but the goal is ultimately to replace that water with effluent water so they'll get off the groundwater. Now, do we charge them for the irrigation? Or is, I mean, how does, how does that work when they're irrigating their land out there? Is there meters? And will the affluent be a different pricing? Or? Do you want me to take that? Do you, know? you want to take that? Sure. I'll defer to Bob. Okay. Currently, uh, Newland is responsible for the non-potable system and the wells. And they, they would uh, charge the HOAs for their cost of service on their properties. The city is also a customer on that property. So we are in discussions with Newland as far as the rate that uh, should be charged there. It's $3 per 1,000 uh, acre feet, that, or 1,000 uh, cubic feet that is currently being charged. It's about the same as a commercial rate or a large volume use uh, uh, that a, a water user would pay otherwise in the city. It's not the reclaimed rate that, uh, because it's not really reclaimed water. It's really non-potable water that's being delivered. It is a private system, though, at this point in time. OK. So they're basically charging themselves because they're the vast owner of that HOA. Sort that's of. correct. OK. Joanne? So for efficiency's sake, um, I did not realize that we, you said we have the largest reverse osmosis system in the state. Is that what you would say? It's a potable drinking water plant, yes, ma'am. So um, for efficiencies, who do you benchmark against? How, how do you look for possibilities of improvement or anything like that when, you, when you're the biggest guy around? <laughs> I'll, answer it, I'll answer it this way, Council Member. Um, Arizona is kind of stuck when it comes to reverse osmosis on large municipal mm -hmm. because of the concentrate disposal issues. There's no place to put it. Mm -hmm. right. Most large utilities, uh, Scottsdale being one, um, put it back into the sewer system, which is what we do as well. But if we were to grow that system, we'd have to really look at that brine concentrate and how much volume that takes up in our wastewater plant. Right, right now, we're, it's manageable for us. It does a couple of things. One is it actually dilutes a lot of the um, heavy solids that come through the plant. So it allows us to treat more efficiently within the plant. Um, but if we were to grow, we'd have to really take a look at that um, concentrate. So is that, is that another reason why we've uh, become kind of the test bunny for that, those brine um, beds that we've, I forget what you're growing there, but whatever those are. <laughs> right. We're growing salt tolerant grasses as, right, as right, a means right. to okay. um, try and mitigate the, the mm. concentrate. And I believe Mark Holmes has more on that in, in, the, okay. in the resource, water resources. So. One other efficiency that's not on the slide that I'd like to talk about, Bob mentioned uh, briefly in, in the introduction, was the reorganization we just completed within, the, within our group. I'm really proud of the fact that uh, we're able to promote seven or eight of our own individuals to uh, supervisory positions and then backfill those positions with lower staff members into utility two and senior utility tech positions. So um, we've done a really um, good job at the department, I believe, with, with doing that. We've built morale back up. Um, guys are excited to come back to work, and that's just going to lend itself to better efficiencies. I want to thank Bob and, and, uh, and his support 
in uh, developing those as we move forward. Um, several performance measures that we'll touch bases on right now. Um, the first one we look at is our monthly peak demand uh, in percentage as it relates to our total production capacity. Currently, the city of Goodyear has a total production capacity of 14.9 million gallons. Our peak day in 2013 was 11.7. So we're right at about that 80% mark. Um, you'll see a target there of 80.41% uh, and currently trending at 60%. That's because it's been a um, relatively mild winter. And typically in the <coughs> time, our demands go down. We'll start to see that increase as the temperatures get warmer. Um, but we're, sh we're probably going to be close to that 80% again this year. Um, peak demand in relation to total capacity, again, um, as you see the summer months, July, August, September, we're in that 75 to 85% range. And then as the weather cools down, we drop a little lower. On the wastewater side, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is the capacity specifically at the Goodyear facility. We're watching that closely um, by state rule. When we hit the 80% mark of design capacity, we have to be in design for expansion. We are in that at the moment. Um, we typically are running at about 80%. Uh, we try to target about 70, uh, about, we're targeting 85% this year, and that's based on a lot on the growth and, and demands of the system. Uh, we're trending at 77. Again, it follows the same curve as the winters and summers, so we'll start seeing that peak out a little bit as we get warmer. The third one is we'll talk a little bit about our sanitation program again. 25% um, we're targeting as our recycled diversion rate. So we're taking 25% of all the weight or all the garbage is actually recycled. And uh, so we're, we're hitting our targets of 25% with that and we're trending um, on that same level. Joe? Again. How does that number compare to the uh, other municipalities? I don't have that information right now, Council Member, but I can get that for you. Okay, thanks. Bill? Mark, while we're on the recycling, sir, bin, sorry, you couldn't resist. Could you? It wasn't funny. <laughs> the um, are we still? Um, I'm going to say getting paid for the recycling material. Is that at one point there was a, um, or are the costs offset between? I, I think. That, let me just let me back the question up that way. Is having the recycling program costing us money or is it pretty much a wash with what waste management gets and the materials that they have versus our cost for it? Is that, is that all wound together in that contract? Councilman, a great question. Yeah, the recycle. Yeah, it's all recycled. Yeah. Because we used to get that all the time. We were told how much recycled and how much was savings. Well, we used to get continuous reports on that quite a few years ago. When it first came out, because everybody wanted to know what the savings was and how much we were recycling. And in fact, they even had kind of a scorecard on the neighborhoods that were doing a good job and those that were not doing such a good job. So if we dropped all those things. We don't do <laughs> we don't monitor the car that any longer. I just just curious. Uh, Mayor Lord, I, I don't know the answer to that question okay. either. And, and to yours, Councilman Stipp, um, I'll have to get that information for you. If you I, I don't have it right off the top of my head. Sherry. Oh, go ahead. Well, yeah, let me just oh, finish. Bill? I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, um, other than the environmental impact to a diversion rate, I mean, obviously we keep it out of the landfill. That's a good thing. But from a city operational perspective, does that matter? Does the diversion rate matter from an operation standpoint? So regardless of how the money turns out, for the resident hearing this or someone talking about it, does recycle besides the environment? Does recycling matter to our bottom line? And I'm sure somebody has an answer to that. We, we can. I, I think what we'll do is put together the cost of that because uh, you really have to look at what the, the proceeds of the revenue. Well, I think Larry might have some answers here. I'll, I'll pause. Intuitively, I think I already know the answer to this question. Well, but I think what we have to look at in the short term, the way you're asking the question, it's one contract. Whether anyone puts anything into the recycling or they put everything in the recycling, our costs are the same. In the long term is what you're looking at the savings and that analysis, I think waste management has that information. Mark's operations deal with the bulk waste, but they don't do the recycling, so we don't get that revenue that comes from it. 
and it saves on the tipping charge that the hauler right. pays. Right. So then in the, I'm not going to answer my I'm going to I am going to answer my own question. So theoretically then we're paying less than the tipping fee because we pay that direct. The tipping fee is part of that contract price also for the waste. Keep in mind waste management is picking up both services. Right. We have a tipping fee we pay on the bulk. But this is on the recycle, what goes in, in your okay. colored cans. All of that's built into the rate. I'm, I'm talking very short term under the contract. In the long term, the benefits of recycling have to be anal analyzed as part of the contract in 2019. Okay. So not to leave anyone hanging, the bottom line, though, is recycling is good. It's still a good thing. <laughs> well, we would not want the message to go from this work session to the public. I want to make sure I <laughs> say that it is not good. So environmentally, I think that you know that answer. Sherry? Yeah, I like recycling. It's good. That could be a slogan there. Um, how about the green? Because we were going to do the green recycling. When you get us that information, can you let us know how... Was it, weren't we going to just do like the clippings and that was going to be recycled and I never heard what happened to that. If well, I knew that some of it, uh, Hickman Farms was uh, uh, doing some of the green, well, chopping it up, but that was uh, own, uh, its own, that was our own. Yeah, I think we're using it for some kind of... Uh, right. We're using the city property landscaping stuff, green. Mayor and Council, a couple of years ago we did introduce a green waste uh, program in working with a, a local uh, farmer and uh, uh, however this past year uh, that uh, opportunity did go away so we're seeking opportunities right now uh, to bring that program back um, but that program did end uh, due to um, the lack of a partner right now. And we'll bring it back because recycling is good. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's and green money grows on trees. <laughs> This is really getting bad. Okay, let's go. Everybody's getting punchy. And I have to tell you, we have a ways to go, guys. Right, we have a long ways to go. Let's all get this aura back of shit. Are we all right now? I'll tell you what, everybody stand up and stretch them. Oh, my God. Come on, everybody stand up and stretch them. Stretch them. We have to take a moment out of your talk. Just all right. Go. Mark. Okay. Because we've got a, long, Mark. You got a long way to go tonight, guys. So let's go. I've got, I've got two more slides, right. and I promise you I'll be well, fast. Well, you're not the last, though. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get drenched with water. Okay. Um, the challenges facing the Environmental Services Department are, are what, what we would expect in our system, aging infrastructure both on the wastewater side and on the water side. Um, the condition of our sewer system, uh, some of our sewer system is vintage 1950. And I'm talking well, about the historic Goodyear area. So yeah, it's, we've got some old pipes out there that still uh, have to be maintained. And, and did, some did we not change some of that in like in like historical Goodyear? I mean, didn't we work when you just, is that part of your presentation or is that? I, I believe several years ago they worked on the water system. I'm not yeah. sure that they okay. completed the wastewater system. Oh, I didn't system. know if they did that. Okay. Um, we do have manholes out there that are stick, uh, still the old brick and, and they're, they're starting to show age. Um, as far as manholes go, there are uh, 5,171 manholes within the city. Uh, last year we were able to rehabilitate 27 of them, and we still have 15, 20 planned per year. Um, they're, they're pretty expensive to take care of, but you know, we're, we've got them in our budget to do that. As far, as far as I think it's really important. Me? I've heard stories on, uh, from Mayor Scruggs at Glendale, and, and uh, that can get really serious if we don't, if we don't uh, do keep something. up on that. And Absolutely. So That's part of our asset management program okay. and what we're working So towards. we'll be looking for that. Um, uh, along with the uh, condition of the sewer system, um, but understand we're still flowing and we're still doing well in terms of uh, getting keeping on the maintenance. So. Um, the aging plants, uh, there are sections of the Goodyear uh, Water Reclamation Facility, 1980s vintage, as well as Corrigate and Rainbow, both um, getting older. And these systems, as they get older, they require more work and more maintenance. So we're, on, we're working towards that. Uh, as far as the water system goes, um, the, the aging infrastructure. Sir? Just, just a comment for you on the sewer. Many, many years ago, a former life as a tax auditor was able to uh, do an audit on a company that I forget it was info form or something like that. What they did is they repaired sewers. And, and what it is is um, 
some type of an adhesive epoxy. They would fill it up with water. They'd fill it inside the sewer. They'd blow it up. It would adhere to the walls. They cut it at both ends, and you know, kind of like a liner inside. Do they still do anything like that in repair? Absolutely. The technology is still there. Still there? Okay. Yeah. Just sure curious. Is. And they've, they've gone even further on some different technologies. But. So you don't have to rip the whole thing up. You can put a liner inside Correct. to save costs as you do that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, on the water side, uh, we do have some aging wells. As you know, um, several of our Goodyear wells date back to the 1940s. We have an aggressive maintenance program mm -hmm. on those where we clean uh, two of these a year. We have 12 in production at the moment. Um, we clean up the scale buildup and, and the other things that will block the, the slots from allowing the water through. Roughly it's $50,000 a piece when we do that. So it's, a, it's an extensive program. And we're on, a, we're on a cleaning cycle. Every four to five years we, we go through our wells and then we start over again. Um, so we're on top of that. Our reservoirs, we've got one old one up in, up in Australia Mountain. The original uh, reservoirs is 1980s from the 80s and that's going to require some rehab uh, in the next couple of years. Probably our largest challenge ahead of us right now is providing, uh, is providing infrastructure, a challenge to stay ahead of those growing areas, uh, specifically in the south, south part of our community. We have a good handle on what's going to happen in the West Goodyear side. Um, it's the south side. As we grow, trying to ensure that our infrastructure meets not only the, de uh, the development of the Australia Mountain, but also the ancillary properties as well, so that we're upsizing our pipelines and our water mains uh, to ensure that everybody can get sufficient water down there. It's a major challenge. Um, some last slide I have for you, I promise, is the priorities for 14 and 15 uh, will be to implement that asset management program, looking at things like our water mains, our manholes and such. Um, we're going to complete the installation of our next production well. As we mentioned earlier, we're peaking at about 80% of our production capacity. We're going to be installing another well next year to help uh, alleviate that problem. Um, high priority for this coming year, we've touched on it earlier, is the uh, utility rate study. We'll be working to complete that. We're going to work to continue our SCADA enhancements by improving network efficiencies and communication. And lastly, uh, based on the uh, results of the corrugate disc filters, um, we're going to be looking at uh, changing out the disc filters at the Goodyear plant as well to try and capture some of those efficiencies. And with that, I'll turn it over to the third Mark's brother. Is there any, is there any last oh, questions? Is, is that, is that, yeah, well, I was going to say which one. Yeah. Now water resources. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I got you to sit, stand up, but nobody wanted to stand up with me. So Did you? Okay. Well, we're going to go on. Oh, oh. You're splitting. Okay, we'll then we'll split. went to the... Okay. He's here. There you go. We're here. Thank you for giving us that break. You're now on <laughs> water resources. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Mayor Lord. Members of the Council, um, I'll try and be brief. Um, we're going to cover the water resources uh, division. Um, underscoring some of the uh, quartile one programs, we have uh, water banking, which primarily deals with uh, uh, long range plans, uh, agreements, and permits. These are part of the state requirements regulatory requirements. Uh, number two is water resource management. Um, again, as your water resource division is a lead uh, in your water resource planning and communications for the city um, in your regional efforts as well. Uh, third is water quality. Um, as you're well aware, we have two Superfund sites and a wharf site here, Water Quality Assurance, Assurance Revolving Fund, which we want to monitor and ensure the uh, security of our water supplies from a water quality standpoint. And lastly, we have uh, Reclaim water management, which is the ability for us to take all of our reclaimed water and store that water underground within the aquifer for future use. Water Resources Division. Total budget is a little over $700,000. Uh, Forty-five percent of that is uh, personnel uh, covering three uh, full-time equivalents. Fifty-two percent is contractual. Uh, these are services covering technical, uh, legal memberships and training. And of course, uh, Council Member Stipp will provide you the numbers for our training um, as you request it. 3% is commodities, uh, fairly small, covering cost fuel and minor equipment and safety supplies. Fiscal year 13 14 supplementals. Um, thank you for those. Um, they are identified as uh, AWR well spacing and well impact analysis. Uh, this is nothing more than the ability of us to do a hydrologic study and looking at our existing wells to try and increase uh, the amount of groundwater we can legally pump from the well. So actually trying to increase our legal withdrawal authority. 
So we've uh, we've started with a, uh, a comprehensive study, and we're now in the permitting process uh, for that activity. I'll touch on it again here shortly. Um, we also have Central Arizona Replenishment Obligation. This is, uh, we uh, have a contract with the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District. That's in case uh, during the summer months we have a lot of uh, peak water demands and we have potentially a well go down, we have to actually potentially pump additional water from our wells and maybe exceed the legal uh, authority so we're actually using excess uh, water. So this is our backup. We had talked about that in a work session, mm -hmm. our backup uh, plan for that. Um, we also have annual groundwater withdrawal fees um, to DWR, Arizona Department of Water Resources. Um, we pump groundwater and we replenish what we pump. Um, there are withdrawal fees the state requires us to pay on an annual basis. And then uh, Water Resources Plan Advisor, thank you. Um, huge, huge uh, help on the Water Resources Division. We hired, uh, as mentioned earlier, Gretchen Irwin. She's uh, undertaking a lot of the project management and long-range planning right now. So she was hired in January of 2014. We also have a groundwater savings facility permit with RID. What that really is is us taking our reclaimed water as another, uh, we'll call it a uh, more robust discharge. If we're uh, recharging and say we want to do maintenance on our recharge facility, we could actually work towards uh, putting that reclaimed water with uh, in the RID canal. What that would allow us to do is actually gain long-term storage credit using another permit called a groundwater savings permit, which basically allows them to use rec reclaimed water for irrigation and then prevents them from pumping the additional water, which we would get credit for as a future supply. Also, we had mentioned earlier was a sat site recommissioning. We have uh, finalized the hydrologic work for that, and we have submitted permits. So very soon we'll be putting water back at the recharge facility. The plumbing is being finalized uh, as we speak here today. So um, it's all coming together. That's very exciting. Some of the efficiencies. Um, we've identified some of the cost uh, savings with the efficiencies. Uh, the first is increasing the legal uh, groundwater withdrawal. Authority mentioned earlier, that's actually increasing, using that uh, supplemental, uh, increasing the legal withdrawal authority from a well. Um, what that will do is right now we think that uh, one of our wells provide potentially up to four times the current withdrawal authority. And that's based on the new hydrologic groundwater model we've been uh, getting three different uh, activities with, which are our designation renewal and also the Vado Zone Injection Well Project, which we've already, we've already talked about. What that savings would be is actually uh, almost like getting a well for free. Uh, a cost of a current production well is about one to two million dollars for all the activities that go into drilling, um, all the water quality testing, uh, making sure the well is, meets all of the requirements, the regulatory requirements. So allowing us to do this and move forward, we're, we're finalizing, our, again, our permits. Um, we feel very confident we'll be able to get um, four times withdrawal authority. Um, so that's very exciting. Increasing groundwater recharge opportunities, uh, banking reclaim water and saving that water for uh, future uh, water purchases uh, or drought proofing the community. Uh, right now, if we were, as we get ready to uh, take our reclaimed water and recharge that, that's an uh, annual value, a savings of $700,000. That's water, that's today's value. As we had mentioned before in, in uh, some of our, our, our work sessions, um, it's a commodity. So in, as we go forward, that'll actually increase in value as the cost of water increases. Um, so the savings will increase. We've created partnerships uh, with the use of remediated groundwater. You've uh, approved two access agreements and the use of remediated groundwater with uh, the PGA North, the Crane Co. folks, uh, which is providing uh, remediated water to the community park. Uh, it's about a savings of $30,000 per year, and you just finalized one recently. Uh, thank you. That's a, a great one. That's providing remediated groundwater to the ball field complex. Cost savings, depending on that usage, between somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars. So a significant savings there. What's the status of that right now? Uh, moving forward with uh, initiating the, uh, uh, I'm sure the engineering folks, I can, I'll double check the current status, but uh, design was in, uh, just a matter of going out for the, the construction contracts. Okay. I know that the uh, Goodyear Tire folks, the same thing, they've finalized their designs and they're moving forward with contracting for the construction. I'm, I'm sorry, was that annually, 200 to 300,000? Yes, that was annually. That's what I thought. I That's just correct. And then the uh, Central Arizona Project Renewable Water Orders. Um, if you recall, we've been doubling our, our annual CAP water orders to meet our replenishment requirements uh, to meet state law. Of course, CAP water is the cheapest water commodity we can order. It's about one-third the cost of the CAGRD. So we'll continue using the more economical renewable water supply to meet our replenishment obligations until the day that we're able to take it directly. Um, of course, we partnered twice now, uh, last two years with El Mirage. That has provided a cost savings of $167,000. Actually, we generated new revenues coming to the, the city uh, enterprise funds, and uh, that had no impact on our water resources portfolio. Just to mention a couple of the uh, performance measures, 
There's actually two sides of the house we have performance measures on. One is the supply side and efficiencies. The other is demand side where our customers um, are using water. The first is uh, dealing with um, um, a home irrigation checkup. So we'll get a call at the Water Resource Division for someone who wants to try and reduce their outdoor water use. So we'll actually go out and conduct an audit, uh, look at their irrigation, their landscaping. Uh, Sandra Rohde was uh, mentioned earlier. She is really the landscape um, specialist that goes out and helps uh, each of our customers and identify cost savings uh, by reduction of water. So you'll see here um, in the chart um, the actual for 2011. What this is is um, that was about, in 2011, that's 71 customers who called in and requested a home irrigation checkup. We've gone out and then uh, assessed their situation gave them suggestions, and they employed, employed those suggestions into some sort of uh, water saving. So we look at the 12 months uh, previous to that year, their water uh, consumption, and then we look at the post, the uh, home irrigation checkup with the water consumption. So what you're seeing there is, is a total uh, percent of reduction of water use for those 71 customers in 2011. We need to remind uh, the, anybody listening that that is the Goodyear water, which is on the north side of I-10. South side of it. Yes. Sorry. It's, it's for Goodyear, uh, Goodyear, Goodyear Service Goodyear, Area. That's correct. Not Liberty. That's correct. So I just, and, and do we get calls for, uh, thank you for catching me on that. Do we get calls from people wanting to have that system? I mean, people from Liberty Water? Yes, companies? we do refer them over to Liberty's, uh, which and, Liberty is And at. Liberty is doing it? Yes, they, oh. they are a part of their. They are required by the Arizona Corporation Commission to have various water conservation components similar to the city's uh, components that we offer. Okay, thank you. And so you see as we go through time that uh, it is getting lower. Our target is 20%. Um, as you see, the low-hanging fruit is usually hit right away, and then as you move from those, it becomes we're hitting more of the more efficient homes, uh, the residential areas. Cheryl Lynn, you had a question? Well, I, it wasn't a question. It was a comment. It was just that I did, I did request that, and I did get... Um, and she was wonderful, and it has resulted in a significant savings for me. Very good to hear. That's so great. I just wanted to. Well, that's a good testimonial. You know Thank you. The last one I touch on is <clears throat> we had talked about um, our summer water consumption is um, very high in the summer compared to the winter months. Um, so part of this is uh, trying to determine a performance measure to measure the, uh, the effectiveness of our conservation messaging. Um, or the implementation of policies to try and reduce that peak summer demand. Our goal, again, if you recall, 60 to 70 percent of our overall total water demand is for outdoor water use. So part of that is to this performance measure looks at um, taking the, uh, the winter versus summer usage and looking at that volume of water and dividing it by a number of customers and that gives you the gallons per day per housing unit. This is residential usage uh, only. And so you see the difference um, in 2011, that was 115 gallons per day per residential housing unit uh, between winter and summer. As you see, in 2012, it was 102. So we're actually decreasing. So the goal is to continue decreasing this, um, hopefully trying to obtain zero, which would mean that we're using basically the same amount indoors and outdoors and nothing's moving at all. Um, so obviously, you still have to have water for landscaping. Um, but well, our goal is to try and get this as low as possible. Our target for 2014 is 114. So continue to try and have that, that number come down. Some of the challenges, um, again, uh, increasing our CAP water ordering to meet our citywide water demands. Um, also, again, mentioning that 67% of our outdoor water use uh, accounts for that um, uh, the total demand of our service area. Uh, the Water Resource Division would like to have a large-scale demonstration landscape project that explores various types of residential landscapes and streetscapes. Um, uh, trying to establish partnerships. Uh, right now we have uh, verbal partnerships with both ASU and U of A are very interested. We've started uh, looking at the discussions of this activity from design concepts. Um, so we're very excited about that. And of course the goal would be to, uh, uh, I think meeting the city's uh, strategic action plan of having gathering places to educate the community, but also it would help us in demonstrating, leading by example, to create new policies that show beautiful landscapes and yet have low to no or extreme low water use. Uh, so we're very excited to try and do something. Yes. You know, on that note, what would what be uh, thought comes to my mind is so when we have new model homes coming in, maybe some kind of partnership with that home builder of saying, hey, how about let's figure out a beautiful, you know, landscape that we can put then put a sign in the, you know, on the, the yard that says, 
this landscape will only cost you X amount of dollars a year compared to, you know, one with the little green, putting green grass in the front and other things. You know, and that might be just something like that. Or even when we're finally doing some new right-of-way landscaping of saying, look at this beautiful, you know, you have colorful types of flowering bushes and you have these desert, you know, um, plants. This is what, you know, sometimes people have a hard time envisioning how pretty that can be when you when you talk about, you know, just desert landscaping sometime. And so showing them and then the savings, that might be helpful. Uh, Councilman Osborne, you're right on track. Um, you know, incentivizing development, whether it's through uh, demonstration in the model homes or as part of the entitlement process, could be very rewarding um, as we look at uh, incentives to uh, encourage uh, outdoor water use reductions. Mm -hmm. You're right on, right on track. Um, utilizing all options to ensure all of our reclaimed water is recharged in the aquifer and, and stored and saved for uh, when we actually need to use that. And of course, I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, brine disposal. The brine is an actual water resources, and so looking at, as we talked about uh, the Central Arizona Salinity Study, how do we how do we dispose of that in an effective way where we can get it potentially out of our reclamation facility and free that up for for new growth, and have yet something of a, a small capital investment that actually can deal with this brine. It's still a water supply. How do we dispose of that? So we're looking uh, again as a challenge uh, moving forward uh, how we're going to deal with brine disposal, not only in the north but also in Rainbow Valley. Uh, we're going to be dealing with RO and brine down there. So our priorities for fiscal year 14-15, um, I mentioned earlier, integrated water master plan. This would be a uh, revision and update with emphasis on the southern solution, as you're probably aware that uh, there's a lot of activity heading in the south and uh, looking at the water supply situation down there. Uh, how water could be utilized in, in the Rainbow Valley or water needs to be moved from the north to the south uh, and what water supplies those would be. Um, also as part of this integrated water master plan looking at a dynamic model that could actually be real-time updated based off of our growth model looking at new development and then we could run scenarios that would actually help us understand what, what additional water supplies would be needed potentially maybe evolving that into infrastructure requirements, uh, reclaimed uh, capacity, those kind of things. So very excited about the opportunities here for this update for the Integrated Water Master Plan. Thank you. Any questions? Just Joe? Come. What is that outreach program? I mean, when we had talked about getting the message out to the public, what's driving water, so that when they see rates, they kind of understand the various dynamics, you know, whether it's recharge, whether it's CAP, whether it's GARD, you know, we had talked about trying to educate the public through a various series of outreach so they understand what's driving these costs. Where's the status of that? I know right now, uh, Vice Mayor, is uh, we're, we're working with our, our uh, consultant for the utility rate uh, study. Um, we thought that would be a great opportunity as part of uh, bringing on board that uh, utility rate commission and having a series of, of public meetings, uh, not only educating the council, but the public the utility rate commission that's going to be evaluating how the various water supplies impact rates what do those water supplies mean for the city the challenges with those water supplies and so forth again um, I know our, our the other side is the uh, the public outreach on the uh, the website I know that we're working with communications on the messaging via in focus but also our website I know that there's a, a revamping the website as well so we're we are making progress and you will see uh, various outreach components coming forward very soon. I appreciate that because I think that's really critical. I mean, it's a very complicated subject and nobody knows it better than you do and try to simplify it so that the average person understand what's driving these rates. Uh, they think sometimes it's just operations what's causing these rates to increase, but there's so many other dynamics on wet paper, you know, all these other requirements. And I, and I think it's important that we put that in English for our customers so they understand, you know, long term, what are they looking at? So. You're right on, and that's uh, again with the utility rate study. That is a, yeah. a primary focus, and that was part of the scoping for that effort to have public outreach be a principal focus of that effort. Okay. Well, and, and I think we also discussed recently that you know, seeing that this is coming down the line for um, our citizens, is that in the in focus we need to have a continual message about about water and um, what it costs. You know, it obviously doesn't come out of the sky very much here. <laughs> as people seem to think that it is. It's not. Uh, again, uh, priorities for fiscal year 14-15 is increasing, again, the Central Arizona Project uh, renewable water ordering. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, the city's designation of assured water supply renewal application. So we're moving forward. We had a kickoff meeting moving forward with that renewal application process. It's a very lengthy uh, process to put all the information together. 
a number of uh, hydrologic studies that will have to be um, uh, conducted. And again, uh, moving forward, we've partnered with the Bureau of Reclamation. You recall that uh, work session we had actually discussed the, uh, the feasibility work with the Bureau of Reclamation, and we have a partner there. We're moving forward with a, uh, a demonstration size project with that effort. With that, I entertain any questions? Questions? Any questions? Thank you. It's a great briefing. Thank you very much. Well, right. you very much. So we're going to move seats now, and uh, uh, Brian, you're going to give the intro to this. Is that uh, one more? What? Oh, engineering. Oh, engineering. Sorry, engineering. I think I don't want to. Sorry about that. <laughs> there it is. I had I hadn't pushed them. I hadn't pushed it back up. Okay. Uh, good evening. What well, we've all been waiting for. Yes. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Take it away, Dave. <laughs> Engineering with excitement. Okay. Right. It's Can a, you make this exciting? Um, <laughs> I, I'll try. I'll try. Um, it's the same outline, so I won't, I won't uh, spend any time on this slide. Um, I've got 28 slides. I'll go through them fairly quickly, but feel free to ask questions at, at any point. Um, the four strategic action areas of the city, and I've listed items under each of the four. Uh, under fiscal and resource management, pri primarily items that uh, increase in efficiency such as electronic plan review and in-house design or save money uh, for the city. Uh, a federally funded project, uh, projects which are, you know, bring grant funds into the city. And then uh, managing leases and, and, uh, and property purchases for the city uh, to make sure that we're in compliance with our, our, our responsibilities. <laughs> Economic vitality, uh, supporting the development services community, plan review, permitting construction, and then the uh, expanding the fiber optic network, as well as supporting other divisions internally, such as uh, ballpark, um, where we have equipment such as an aerial lift that can uh, set banners, for example. And then customer service and supporting other departments, uh, for example, economic development with their website. A uh, sense of community. Uh, some of the projects that we manage um, directly um, benefit the community, such as the parks and the library projects are two examples. We receive uh, quite a number of customer um, questions or inquiries or complaints uh, regarding traffic or just questions about projects that we're working on. Yeah. And then from time to time, we're invited to attend uh, school events, uh, functions, uh, could be judging science fairs or um, telling students, you know, what, engin what engineers do and that type of thing. Uh, quality of life, uh, out in the right-of-way, you know, keeping the streets clean and safe and maintained, and then um, also moving traffic um, efficiently through the city. This is our organizational chart, uh, 37 positions. Um, in three major areas, over on the far left, under Keith Brown, we have real estate services and project management. Kind of just left to center, um, under myself, uh, GIS, plan review, inspection, and permits. Those are the development related, development service related areas. And then over on the right, um, items that pertain to right of way maintenance, pavement ma uh, maintenance, street maintenance, sweeper, uh, street sweeping, traffic operations, and sign signing markings. Uh, budget personnel. Um, engineering bu um, budget comprises about 9% of the city's budget, about 8.2 million, split into two areas, the general fund side of about 2.3 million, and then the HERF, or the street traffic operation side of about 5.9 million. It's <clears throat> fairly evenly balanced between personnel and commodities and contracts. We have 30, I mentioned we have 37 positions. This next slide. Um, I'm sorry, and Joanne? You, I know we're going to be talking about this in the meeting. How many vacancies do you have right now? We currently have three vacancies. Three? Okay. Yes. And they're, and they're all being advertised. They're three engineering vacancies? Three, three vacancies in the engineering department, a, a director position, a civil engineer, and a uh, tra um, traffic signal technician. And they're, and they're all being uh, currently under advertisement. Uh, under the 
uh, general fund side of the department, uh, the 2.3 million, is split among six divisions, administration, plan review, permits, inspections, GIS, and project management. There are 21 positions um, that are funded through the general fund. It's fairly heavily, more heavily weighted on personnel and just uh, a small portion is <coughs> commodities and contracts. And I'll cover each of these uh, six sections uh, next. So under administration, we have six uh, people. We, um, we manage most of the administra administrative functions of the department. Uh, um, we also do you know, the strategic planning. We do coordination with other agencies, uh, such as MAG, ADOT, uh, MCDOT, Valley Metro. And then we um, directly manage the real estate services function and the capital improvement program function. The next division, plan review, five people. Uh, we review all types of, of construction plans that are improvements out in the street right of way or site improvements, everything up to but not including the building on sites. Uh, we maintain our engineering and design standards. We manage our stormwater management um, report preparation annually. Uh, we're our flood, floodplain administrator for the city. Uh, we manage all the construction bonds. Any, any work that's in the right-of-way requires a construction bond, so we, we manage all the, the bonding. Uh, we maintain the electronic plan review uh, system for engineering, assist all the external and internal users. And then we, um, we manage all the um, approval letters from the county pertaining to water and sewer projects. Under permits, we have one, uh, one uh, development permit technician currently um, processes all the permits. Once, all, once the plans are, are, are approved, then the permits are issued by this individual, uh, checking to make sure they have all the proper licenses and insurance to work in the right of way. Can I ask a question? They, uh, Molly, can you tell me what the turnaround time is once the plans are approved and the permit is given? Uh, the time to issue a permit? Yeah, how long does it take the person uh, to with, get a permit once their plans are approved? Uh, once, um, once the plans are approved, then they come into the counter and within uh, usually the same day or our, our, our maximum is three days. We allow three days, but yes. typically it's same day or next day the permit would be issued. Okay, and is our plan turnaround still 10 days? Is what we're trying to do? We're trying, we're trying to improve it. Um, currently it's, it's 20 days on first review and 15 days on subsequent reviews. And we're working uh, to improve that turnaround time. So when you're going to do a project here in the city, you've got a plan on 35 days of just going through the city maze. To start with. Well, that's that's the time it takes for the construction plans. Before that, there there, there are various planning reviews that have to occur first, and th those those are submitted to the planning department. And they route them through the city. So um, once it's gotten the planning approval, then and they submit their construction plans, and it's 20 and 20 and 15. So it could be more than 35 days. <laughs> if if they need some type of okay. planning action, like a site plan approval or a preliminary okay. plot approval, final plot approval, then that would be ahead of the construction plans. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We also, um, this person also issues all the uh, traffic control plans for any construction in city right of way. Uh, for inspections, um, once the permits are issued, they're assigned to uh, one of three inspectors uh, by geographical area. So they'll, they'll um, inspect all the private development as well as the city um, projects within their geographical area. And um, along with uh, construction inspection, they will uh, make uh, stormwater inspections to uh, keep us in compliance with our stormwater permit. Under GIS, uh, two people, uh, they maintain all the land base that all the other layers of information of data are built upon, such as the utility layers. Um, they provide the, base, the basis for the emergency response system, the 911 system. And they also provide the basis for Wally? some. Wally, I have another question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do we have a uh, a handout 
of a map for the city of Goodyear that shows all of our streets, not the economic development map. You mean the grid? Well, you know, when someone comes into town and they want a map of Goodyear, do we have such a thing? Because if we do, I can't find one. The chamber has one. The chamber has one. But and we go to they go to the city to get all the streets. Yeah, what do no, but do we have one just for Goodyear, not for Avondale, Litchfield Park, Tolleson, all of those? We we can make those. We we don't have any up at the front counter uh, just as handout material because they they're they're very large maps. They take uh, they're basically uh, 36 by six feet long, and there are two of them because of the length of the city. So I'm thinking of like a triple A map, you know. Nothing um, nothing that small because uh, it wouldn't. For one thing, it, it'd be very difficult to show the the entire city on a map that small and, and be able to read the street names. So. Uh, we, we we don't produce well, a map. What is what are the use you're thinking? Well, for? I, I was guess thinking that's a question. just even when people are coming in to our city, that we have a city map that shows them where Estrella is and shows them where the the, the golf cart course is up in Estrella, and it also shows them, you know, where Litchfield Park starts. When people ask me, you know, where's it? Where can we get a map of Goodyear? I do tell them to go to the chamber, and I've gone to the chamber and gotten it. But I immediately have to tell them we're bounded by the north, by Camelback, and the west by Perryville, and the east by Dysart. And, but it doesn't tell you, you know, someone says, well, all of our streets have the same name. I live on Pinshot Avenue. Well, there's other Pinshot Avenues in Goodyear and Pinshot Courts, but they're not where I live. They're elsewhere. So people get confused. They don't know where to go. And, I've just been asked a couple of times of, you know, where do we get a, a map of Goodyear? And since our chamber is not a Goodyear chamber, their map is of their member cities, which is fine. But I was just wondering, did our city ever do just a map of Goodyear? And apparently we don't. We, so we, thank you. We did when, I think we did when it was smaller or when, when it wasn't quite as um, spread out. But, I mean, it's, it's a good idea. Um, I think... We'd have to. Um, Today we can't do it and sell ads and then make money on it. Yeah. We have to decide, I guess, the size of the map, and then um, and I think it'll 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 have to be on several pages just because. If, oh, well, don't make it so. No, I don't want to. Well, or, or maybe sorry. maybe something I just like. Want a map that maybe you like north it's of the It sounds simple. <laughs> yeah, but it can't be done. So. Well, it can be no, done. it's not it that it can, can be, be done. done. It comes at a cost, and it comes at. Uh, uh, a balance, and so I think it's all of that. And I'm just thinking for recruitment tools. Yeah, you know, yeah. pass it out when we are having people come to look at us. Maybe we can well, kick that around internally, and, and maybe it's a map like north of I-10, I-10 to the river, and then Estrella. Might now, be economic a good development way to, has a map well, that they, with, uh, yeah. that they give out. Map. That's so, what I give out too. When anyone yeah. asks me, that's yeah. that's exactly I mean, it, what I give out. It's not an abnormal request mm -hmm. in a city. I just don't think at this t point feasible. in time. Um, that's my opinion. So. No, you're right, and we don't want to split the city. That's the one thing. Yeah. We want we're all of Goodyear, I don't care if we're north, south, east, or west. So we don't want a map of the north and a map of the south. And you know. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I just wondered if we ever did it. I just thought maybe we uh, did it sometime. I, I, I think I can remember when we had one that would be like the historic area when, when the city was much smaller, but as it started to expand, it, I, I don't think I've seen one uh, for the public okay, like that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. 30 years. For 30 years, you have not. So. And then the um, the sixth area under the general fund would be project management. So, designing all the all the city projects, and as well as taking them through the bidding and the construction and the handover stage uh, to the to the user department. And then along with CIP projects, we also assist other departments with managing non-CIP projects, such as some of the parks projects. Uh, that's the ones I can think of that aren't necessarily CIP, but they're major, maybe major operation improvement type projects that we assist with. And, not, and then the other side of the budget in engineer would be the, the HERF side. So that would be um, five divisions, signs and street marking, street maintenance, sweeper operations, traffic signal operations, and traffic engineering. It's about 25 percent personnel and about 75 percent commodities and contracts and and the major commodities would be things like electricity for street lights and traffic signals uh, all the pavement um, preservation material that we buy the asphalt and the different types of uh, 
applications that we apply to the pavement. Those are the major costs under the under the commodities. And I've got a slide for each one of the five I'll go through briefly. Under signage and street markings, one employee uh, maintains uh, city signs throughout the city. Um, right now, actually for several years, um, for, uh, nationwide, there's been requirements that put in place to upgrade signage for uh, reflectivity, um, to meet re reflectivity specifications. So. We're in the middle of that right now, as far as getting ready to upgrade some of our signs that need that, uh, as well as pavement markings. And then each of the, I think each of the, well, four of the five divisions are also involved in 24-hour standby. So that could be a call out due to, a, um, say, a traffic accident requiring a street closure, or usually it has to do with some storm event that they go out and, and have to, uh, you know, Clean out, clean out, clean the roads, and get the road, road roads uh, open again. So the next one is street maintenance. Uh, six individuals, um, the pavement management program, uh, as well as um, just general street maintenance and, and concrete or sidewalk maintenance. Uh, it could be potholes, could be uh, sidewalks that are are heaving where they have to replace uh, sidewalk sections. And then they're also part of the 24-hour um, standby program, so they, they could be called out as, as necessary. Uh, sweeper operations, two, two uh, sweepers, two sweeper operators. They sweep all the city streets. And in a little while, I'll mention one of the efficiencies, which was uh, an IGA with the county, whereby we, we sweep some of the county roads in exchange for the county grading some of our dirt roads. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Again, they're part of the 24-hour uh, standby response. Uh, traffic signal operations. Uh, we have roughly 80, I think it's 88 signalized intersections uh, in the city. So they, they maintain the, the signals um, through an annual maintenance program as well as uh, quarterly and monthly um, maintenance that they do, as well as responding to any problems that occur. They've got the equipment available to to get up to maintain the traffic signals, and uh, as well as you can see in one of the pictures there, where they'll they'll hang Christmas uh, season banners, and as well as spring training banners and banners over at the ballpark. And again, they're part of the 24-hour uh, standby, primarily as it relates to traffic signals. So they one of them would get called out if there's a problem. Molly, how many do you have in that department? Oh, I'm sorry. We have we have four and one vacancy currently that we're in the, getting ready or in the process of filling. I have Joanne? a question to wake everybody up. <laughs> hey, no, nothing. No offense. Um, <laughs> no, so that sounded terrible. I know it did. That's why I said no offense, David. So you you spoke of of the um, the banners. Yes. When. Are we going to decide that the All American 2008 banners need to come down? Today. I'm just going to throw that out there <laughs> because it's getting a little old. And yeah, so, it is. until we decide to yeah. try again, I'm just I'm going to throw that question out. <laughs> we'll always be an All America city, yes, but it says 2008, so I'm just well, it's, thought that's that history. Not the ones that are on the on the actual um, you know traffic poles are nice, yeah. but yeah. they don't wear like the the banners, and they're not on every traffic. City line. Manager, anyway, just side throw it out. Yeah, yeah um, no, it's great observation. Uh, it says All America City, and by their requirements, you have to post a year in which you got it. So that's uh, why it says 2008 wasn't our choice. Uh, could not agree more. Once you're All-America City, you're always in All-America City. Um, so it's something we are proud of. We want to leave up there. And then the bigger question is how often do you have to maintain those, um, whether they're affixed uh, right to the standards or or banner types. And yeah, that's probably the bigger question, just looking at the maintenance of that. Um, however, if there's policy direction to get rid of the All-America uh, City emblem, 
Um, that's certainly something we can look at, but staff was not looking at doing that. Uh, well, I just didn't know how they are expensive. I thought. I mean, it was 2008, but it's historical. It's an event, and it was a good event to win, and it was it's acknowledged I didn't say throughout that. the United States. I didn't so, say it's taking that. them down would not be probably. I'm not going to well, get into this, but it's not that important right now. It's but on the signals, though. Uh, Mike. Yes. My comment would be, indeed, the cloth ones are vinyl or whatever yeah. they are, um, do wear and fade. Mm -hmm. And so at one point, I mean, the decision at that point is, do we take them down because it's embarrassing and, and I don't know if we want to replace them or not. But again, the ones on the street signs are, are fine. don't yeah, have the same cool. fading. Okay. So it would make more sense to leave them in, uh, in much That's longer. But banners. once those signs are an embarrassment because they're so faded and icky, then I think they, I agree with you. I think they need to come in. Good. Well, now you know that for later conversation. Yes, Go thank ahead. You. Okay. And the fifth uh, division under her traffic engineering two individuals uh, they maintain the uh, fibers and conduit fiber system citywide traffic signal coordination uh, they operate the traffic management center over on Western Avenue uh, they're, they're the ones that work with uh, with our grant administrator to um, to apply for the federally funded projects to expand the system and anytime we Anytime the city designs a traffic signal, they, that section would actually do the, 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 the design of the construction plans for a, a city install signal. And uh, they respond to resident business concerns re related to traffic, related to traffic signal operations, uh, you know, any, any equipment that's malfunctioning. Fiscal year 2014 supplements, five of them, inspector overtime. Uh, we put this in because of our IGA with Avondale. That was one of the features of the IGA that, you know, we could potentially work overtime um, to cover their project. They, they would pay us, but uh, we, we just had minor usage. Most of it's had to do with uh, city events where we've provided traffic control um, surveillance or making, maintain traffic control for weekend events. Uh, pavement maintenance. This would be the uh, the projects that are currently under construction are on Bullard Indian School and I think next Pebble Creek. In fact, today um, Luke informed me that they had paved um, the median openings in the le uh, in the turn lanes along Bullard Avenue. So that's underway and, and moving forward. Uh, traffic signal rewires. They um, rewired three signalized intersections along Litchfield Road. And, and while they were doing that, any of the street name signs that were had burned out, they replaced those along with some others. And the fifth one was a uh, updated traffic management software, which is on order. We're, we're working with IT to get that uh, procured and, and then get it um, loaded. We'll start using that. Bill, Dave, are we going to? Um, was it? IGA with Avondale just for a single year, or was that a multi-year IGA? It's it's a multi-year IGA. It was, okay. Um, and then the other question that I had was, uh, was the inspector overtime, was that one-time monies that we put aside for that as well, like we did over, did over PD, or was that a built-in? <clears throat> it's ongoing. We did put it in as ongoing. But we haven't been using it. Is that what I, Last is that what I, I heard? Checked, uh, it was, I think it was at 20000 I think we'd used about three or $4,000 of it so far this year. That's, that's correct. That's, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I covered this one. Okay, efficiencies, uh, three of them listed. This um, IGA with McDot, that's for exchange of services. Um, they grade our dirt roads down in the southern part of the city and we sweep their county roads which are over in Rainbow Valley and it's saving us about about twenty four thousand five hundred dollars per year um, in that I'd say that's a good partnership <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's working out for them it's working out for us mm -hmm. because we're able to optimize our 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 staff Especially and not have to break them away and rent graders our own grader to have them go out and do it so good. it's just much more efficient for us under the second one, I think we've done, I think it's four, I could be wrong, it might be five. 
um, intersections where we've replaced the the burnt out fluorescent tubing with the LED lights, and, and that should save us about three thousand dollars per year. And then the big one is actually the third one. Uh, we designed internally, primarily our assistant city traffic engineer designed uh, all the plans internally for the federally funded projects this year at a savings of about $130,000. So if we'd hired a consultant, we think we would have paid them about, about that much. But he was able to do it um, within his, uh, his right. available time. So. <clears throat> we targeted, I think, five performance measures in, in, in several different areas. Uh, the first one has to do with the res I think we've kind of covered this a little bit already, but it's uh, responding to traffic signal service requests within 24 hours. Our target's 95% of the time, and we've been hitting that actually a little better, um, running a, a little over 96%. That's good. And then the next one we've, we've touched on, it's uh, over in plan review, uh, again, in support of uh, developments, uh, development services um, first review 20-day uh, turnaround time our target of 90 percent of the time and we've been hitting it uh, just just under 95 percent of the time if you look down below we had some we had some real challenges toward the end of uh, middle of last year toward the end and we brought on rbf consultant services to assist us uh, with the uh, increased workload so that brought us back we had some months that were below the target, but then uh, with that assistance, we were able to get back on target for the most part. And then the next one is, um, it's the second and subsequent reviews, a 15-day turnaround uh, meeting at, our target's 90% 90, 90 of the time, and we're, we're hitting it a little over 94% of the time. Same, uh, same challenge uh, toward the, in the fall of last year, and then we were, uh, we were able to get it back on track with the RBF services. Um, Joe? We have a contract, it's my understanding, uh, for uh, with a company to replace the street lights when they go out? We do, with Floresco. Okay. Do they routinely check the city in the evenings to see which ones are on or off? Or are they counting on residents calling that in? Typically it's residents or it could be um, city employees that, that notice it. Okay. Or some t our sweeper operators that are out, they'll they'll know, they'll note it if they see. Um, the only reason why I ask is sometimes you're on the road, you're going and you see them on the street, but you can't really stop and get the number because they're right there on the street itself. Uh, was that is is that usually at the base where that number is located on there? It's about maybe four four or five feet off the ground. It's a yellow vertical tag that's okay. right on the pole. And if somebody calls and doesn't have the tag number, um, we'll. Get the location, and then we'll we'll go out and we'll send we'll send someone out to verify which one it is, and then put the put the work request in ourselves. Okay. Um, this next one is uh, over in over in our street um, sweeping area. Uh, our target is to sweep all our city our city streets uh, every 30 days, 95 percent of the time, and and we're hitting that a little better than 96 percent of the time. It's actually a mandate that we do this um, uh, through the mag through the yeah. countywide mag uh, PM10 program. And they gave us one of those sweepers. Let's see. This is. Oh, I think I went the wrong way. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so th this is in our CIP area. The uh, the measure is to complete projects on schedule which um, our target's 90 percent of the time and we're we're i guess overall hitting around 98 percent of the time what would a project look like uh, it could be anything from a, like a street improvement project like uh, like bullard avenue like what we're doing out there or it could be like the library or it could be like the 911 center it could be a parks project it could be any any okay. any type or size of project and those are the four or the performance measures that we're reporting on tonight. Uh, priorities for for next year, um, just really stay on top of plan review and inspections. Uh, you know, if we uh, 
we, we see spikes that we can respond to them either with our internal staff or by bringing on, you know, uh, temporary consultant services. Uh, pretty much the same thing on capital projects on the CIP side, just, you know, keep them on schedule and on budget. Uh, pavement, main, uh, pavement management, street preservations. We spent, we've been doing a lot of work this year, for actually the past couple of years, kind of culminating this year on a, on a, a program that I think we're bringing back to council after the break, uh, as, a, as far as a comprehensive citywide program. We're in the midst of doing this year's uh, street preservation, but I think after the break, uh, we're going to be bringing back a more comprehensive citywide program. Uh, stormwater management. Uh, Recently audited by ADQ on our stormwater permit. Um, we have stormwater. Yeah, we we, got a we have stormwater. we have a permit, and uh, it revealed a few areas that we need improvement. So we're going to be getting a report soon from them, and then we're going to see how we can how we can address all those items. How do we have a permit for? So that we stay in <laughs> compliance with our permit. Uh, sign maintenance. I mentioned just. Uh, meeting federal standards on sign re reflectivity. And then um, just staying on top of the federally funded projects so we can, we can you know, meet our MAG obligation in terms of the grants that we received uh, and, you know, the fiber and conduit projects, uh, expanding those in the city. Challenges uh, ongoing, just, uh, just keeping up with, uh, with the development side. Um, Private development side not uh, not taking longer than what we what our targets are, and actually trying to improve upon our turnaround times. Pavement management uh, spent a lot of time on uh, pavement preservation, especially as it relates to arterials and and collector streets. But we want we need to ex extend that into the neighborhood streets as well, and get a have a program going there. And then the state and federal requirements. That again ties back to the, the recent audit of our of our stormwater program to make sure we're in compliance um, with that permit. I, I have a question. I, I have a question. Um, so what I, I know you say the goal is ninety percent is for your your plan review permitting. You know that someone wait twenty days is is that what? Is that a benchmark? I mean, is that benchmarked against other cities? I mean, where are we on that? I, I, uh, how do we perform, say, compared to our neighboring cities? Um, I don't have the numbers here, but I know we've done that, and I think it—I think it compares favorably with yeah, on I'd be average. Interested in, I'd be interested in seeing that figure. Me too. <clears throat> okay. The mayor. I'm sorry. Yes. And Sorry. I don't know who is the appropriate person to ask this question, but is there any any way to know from the first time you come in with a plan to the time you get your CFO, what is the reasonable time to expect that to happen? I mean, I understand the first review, the second review, but then we have all the inspections and we have, you know, so. Is there any way to get that kind of a, a, a number? Interesting. I'd, I'd like to take that, uh, yes, try to answer that. We have, for, for the past uh, th two months, I think we've been doing a lot of internal discussions between development services and engineering regarding that process, not just a particular review time, but they, from start to finish. That's what I'm From pre-application, when they come in to begin to talk to development services through C of O or through completion of the project. Because that's really what is more important. How long does it take to get through the process from start to finish? So what, we're, what we will be doing is developing that map, making it very public, putting it on the website. I think you heard uh, Sherry uh, Wakefield Signs talk about the plans that she had uh, uh, laid out in the beginning of the year. Well, we're going to take it all the way through both departments. So the, the benchmarks that you're asking for should be clear. It should be the time to complete or the time to review. How much time does a city have? How much time does the developer or the, the, the applicant have? Because there's two parts to this, this success, uh, an efficient uh, plan uh, and also the city that can review and turn around fairly quickly. 
So we're trying to build in those those benchmarks okay. or measures so they're meaningful and they'll compare with other municipalities as far as their turnaround times. Question. Joanne? This was um, a question by a citizen from Litchfield Park of me, and they were questioning the turnaround time of fire review on a new build. And um, I'm assuming that it doesn't matter prior priority-wise whether it's a Litchfield Park um, item or whether it's a City of Goodyear item. It's just there's a set amount of days that it takes. Is that I'm, correct? I'm going to ask uh, Sherry Wickfield Signs to comment on that. That's under her department. She brought her chair with her, so you can sit down. <laughs> Mayor, Council Members, so um, the fire inspections and fire plan review is under contract, as you're aware, with Litchfield Park with right. the City of Goodyear. Uh, typically, those fire turnarounds uh, in the past had taken approximately two months in review. Uh, over the last year and a half or so, we've reduced that to an efficiency of less than two weeks, typically two to three days. So, no, and it does not matter whether it's... 20 days, so that's why I wasn't sure. Okay. Yeah, that would be really unusual. Okay. So... All right. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. But I'm happy to investigate and find out if there was a, a situation. So I have a question. Is that on someone uh, opening a new business or building a new home, or are they a fire rebuild? No, it's a new new build home. New build home. Okay. Because I know we have had a home in Goodyear. This was Litchfield Park. Well, I know. I'm just okay. saying. In Goodyear that burned. And two years later, they're just now finishing it because they kept getting off track. And they just didn't do anything for a year, year and a half. And the neighbors are complaining to me that they're sick of looking at it. And, and I know I, we drive by it every day, so we know now it now has stucco finally. And I'm hoping that in, I don't know if it's the design guidelines or if we need tea, that when we do have a tragedy like a home burns, that there is a reasonable amount of time that needs to happen to get that home rebuilt if that's what they're going to do, especially if it's in the middle of a subdivision that's a gated community. Uh, Mayor, Council Members, so that was a unique scenario under which um, the life safety situation should have taken precedence over the code or anything else that was occurring there. So typically we would require demolition of the site and then we don't have anything within the code today to require rebuild time. So it's a little bit of a, a you know gray area in the code. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just didn't know if there was any thought of what we might do to help get it done. It's it's I will say it's typically not normal to have a project sit like that because of insurance will, you know, fund the rebuild. What we have seen during the downturn is that quite often homes aren't uh, insured for the replacement value, and that can create a, an interesting scenario as well. Well, I don't think we can count. I mean, I agree. It's been a negative, but um, I don't think that's a norm. So circumstances for sure. So, Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, Mayor, just uh, I was uh, going to this. This is a conclusion of staff's presentation, but just real quickly for tomorrow, there will be four departments that are presenting. Um, we will have uh, I'm not sure exactly what order, but it will be development services. We'll have ITS, fire, and parks and recreation. At the end of that, I'll do a, a recap, and the recap it goes. Uh, it will talk about kind of framework of how we establish a budget because we have a balanced budget uh, that we've worked on that, that we'll be sharing with you and absolutely as we um, go through that, uh, you know, what we do as management, we bring a balanced budget proposal to council and council will um, go through that uh, and then um, a as you go through the budget then it's really becomes your budget if you will. We'll have that uh, framework of how we go through that. We'll also be talking about employees per thousand uh, because we ha will have some position requests, so we'll go through where we're at today, as well as what our uh, fiscal 14-15 priorities are going into next year. So all that will be happening. Uh, we will be giving you um, uh, copies of supplementals uh, and uh, tomorrow as well um, after the council. So just want to let you know that too. Okay, so where are we now on this? 
So we are done with the work session, Kim. Is there yes. anything else from your perspective? Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure before I, okay. So it is uh, now, and we need about 10 minutes to get things uh, set for a regular meeting. So we're going to be, say, probably um, 8 o'clock. Oh, 9 o'clock. Oh, dear. <laughs> 9 o'clock. We'll see you at the dais.